going. Here's the outline for today's workshop that we are about to jump into. We're going to start with why California native gardens, just going over that pretty briefly. Sounds like a lot of you are already convinced, but we're going to ground ourselves in what's awesome about California native gardens. When it comes to design, we'll talk about where do you even start. We will talk about getting some inspiration from natural plant communities as a way to base our design, whether or not we want a naturalistic style garden. Then we'll go one by one through some key elements of California native garden design. Some of those will be general landscape elements, but with ideas about how to integrate a native design into them. We'll go over choosing plants and some top online resources for doing your plant research and choosing plants. We'll go through the design process and go through a very detailed example, sort of step-by-step -step of the kind of laying out a real landscape design process usually using California native plants. We'll talk a bit at the end if we have time, and we probably will, about the basics of using California native design for wildlife habitat. We have a whole other workshop just about that, so I will mention that, but introducing the basics and then some wrap up and additional resources. So with that, we're gonna start with the premise. And it's that landscapes actually take up a lot of space in Southern California. We might have maybe too much asphalt and too much concrete, but if you look at most of California, it's a little bit different than if we look at New York City or downtown Los Angeles from an aerial photograph. There's actually quite a bit of green space, especially in our suburbs. And for a long time, especially in front yard landscapes, really the, the question has been, does it fit in with the neighbors or maybe uh, what does it look like? And what it looks like is important. I think we should all have beautiful gardens, but the last series of droughts in Southern California, at least have really opened up an opportunity for a, a new question and a much wider diversity of front yard landscapes, uh, even in kind of stuffy homeowner situation, uh, homeowner association type situation. And to me, I think the, the really interesting new question, in addition to is a beautiful is, what do our landscapes do for us? What are we putting into them? And what are, what are we and what is the world getting out of it? And big idea is that California native landscapes do more. Let's ground ourselves really quickly for those of you who are just getting into this. So what is a California native plant? A California native plant, non-scientific definition, a plant that's been here for a long time. Uh, basically a plant that evolved in California and along with the insects, birds, and other animals that evolved in California as well. So really suited to place and has unique interactions with some of the insect, birds, and other animals that evolved here as well. And so a California native plant is not rosemary, it's not aloe vera, those are low water plants, but California native plants are plants that are truly from here. And what makes them special in terms of thinking about them in our gardens is that if they are chosen correctly, they can be extremely well adapted to the conditions we have on our sites. Don't need to do soil amendment, don't need to fertilize. We can select plants that are going to grow very well where we are with what we are dealing with in the vast majority of situations. And they have these great relationships with other native plants and animals. Some native animals and insects are generalists and they can thrive from a variety of plant material for food, whether it's nectar or seeds, but a lot of them are what are called specialists and they need certain plants or certain categories of plants that they evolved with. And to make a long, complicated technical story short, the easiest way to provide that is by working primarily with California native plants in our garden. So why would we want them? Well, I'll tell you just a little bit about an average morning in my yard. One of the last times I taught this class, I just went out in the morning with my camera and took some pictures in my backyard. Uh, beauty. You, with California native plants, you can have plants blooming in your yard pretty much year round and beautiful foliage uh, year round as well. Just so much to so much to go with. Uh, lots of habitat. So letting your plants go to seed and the birds will absolutely come around for them. So not cutting back our flowers too quickly. Uh, supporting native pollinators, which need much more help and much more support than uh, the European honeybees, which are mostly what people hear about. 
and native plants do that very well. And a native landscape with a few other features can be one of the best ways or pretty much the best way we can support native pollinators in our home landscape. And in most of California, it truly is, if you build it, they will come. And it is amazing how fast that life shows up. Supporting birds, beautiful plants, blooms, more beautiful than the more conventional landscapes that they're replacing and habitat support. So, I mean, it's really in most of California, as simple as if you wanna help protect the monarch population, which needs a lot of help, plant some native narrowleaf milkweed and they will show up. So that's just one day in my backyard. And that's not to say that I have the most beautiful garden in the world, but basically if anybody plants and learns a little bit about how to take care of a native garden appropriate to where you are, you can have all sorts of awesome stuff going on year round. So to get a little bit more general, they're beautiful. And the plants I'm showing in Southern California gardens in general, after a deep once a week watering the first year or so for establishment, once they put on significant growth, only need to be watered every three to four weeks in the summer, a good deep soak, uh, usually no more than one third of the water use of a lawn. And you get all this beauty. With that comes the habitat value. And whether you like a very naturalistic landscape, which I tend to like, or you like something a little bit more formal and ordered, you can have great wildlife habitat. Here's a Cooper's hawk spending some time in my backyard in the middle of suburban Pomona, California. And it truly is, if you build it, they will come. In addition to the other aspects of resource conservation with the water, uh, again, very little stuff to buy after you get your garden going. These gardens can be self-mulching largely. Uh, you don't need to keep bringing in a lot of material. You generally, unless your soil is highly compact, or very heavily clay, don't need any compost, don't need any fertilizer. And there is no such thing as a no maintenance garden, but I find that if you're doing your garden maintenance yourself, native landscapes are easier to care for. And in hot inland Southern California, one of the really cool things about working with native plants is that most of these plants only need to be touched once or twice a year to freshen them up, some even less than that. But most of that active kind of doing your pruning season is in the spring or in the fall when it's pleasant to be outside. And in the summer, other than the occasional watering and little bits of things here or there, maybe clipping something growing into a path, uh, not a very active time for garden maintenance. It's a time to just enjoy your garden in the, in the morning and in the evening, and then much more active in the spring and the summer. So that's cool. All that stuff together makes our California native gardens much more enjoyable places to live as we surround our houses with them and to learn because things are different every day and definitely every month in a California native garden, much more interesting than a conventional landscape. Lady Bird Johnson, former first lady, was one of the first nationwide kind of very vocal proponents of working with native plants. She said that native plants give us a sense of where we are in this great land of ours. I want Texas to look like Texas and Vermont to look like Vermont. And I'm a bit more cynical than Lady Bird Johnson, but my take is it costs a lot to live in California. So why would I want my yard in the middle of summer to look like a parched imitation of an East Coast or what's ultimately a European landscape style that's just not gonna thrive here or will take a ton of resources to even try it. I'd rather wake up to the natural beauty of California every day and enjoy it every evening. Also gives your cat something interesting to look at. Uh, so yeah, just it surrounds you with kind of beauty all the time, uh, every day of the year beauty and constantly changing. So here's some key concepts to kind of ground us with native design. This is our jumping off point. This is our little bit of philosophy before we then move on to being very practical. A garden is a living ecosystem. It's very different than interior design. Landscape design is a much more dynamic thing. And that makes it interesting. With interior design, if you 
look at your space really well and choose the right couch for your space and put that down. You know, as long as your dog or your cat doesn't shred it, it's going to be there. Things aren't going to change. Garden is a living ecosystem. Things are going to change. Things are going to grow. It's a process. A garden is never finished and always in motion. So this is a year ago, a couple of pictures that I took in my backyard. I have a pretty large backyard. So, you know, doing a garden for me, do all the work myself with my partner on the weekends, isn't something that we were going to be able to put in in this property all at once. So the back corner got planted last. And sometimes it experiences disturbance. So here's, you know, plant that just, it was a little too wet near a bird bath, uh, didn't survive. And that's just always something that's going to happen. You do your research, you, uh, you hope for the best and, and you back that up with, with the research process I'll show you, but there's always going to be something that if you have a large enough yard, uh, you know, doesn't make it. And, and then you kind of think, and you try something new and thinking that way is, is more liberating. It's more fun and it's much more interesting. So it doesn't need to be a perfect, you know, magazine picture all of the time in your yard. And in fact, even all of those gardens have a down season. They just only photograph them in the peak of the season. So this is a wildflower meadow section of my backyard that we let get dry and go to seed because this becomes an incredible songbird habitat with all of these seeds after it does. We're in an urban area, so we don't need to worry about wildfire. You would maintain this differently if you were in an area where you had to. Uh, but it's a, a lot about process. And we have these moments of incredible photographic beauty in different sections most of the year, but it doesn't need to be that all the time everywhere. And thinking about this more as, as a process and as a living system, our gardening and our garden design become based in a larger world of natural science. And that gives us a way to really root our designs and our actions in the garden. And that makes gardening success easier because it's not just why is this plant done blooming? How can I make it be more colorful for more of the year? Uh, it makes gardening success easier because it's beautiful, but it's also based in being part of this dynamic ecosystem. And even if a plant dies, that's kind of just part of the process. It's not something to get frustrated about. So where do we start? The big idea from this workshop is we don't start here. This is a great nursery. This is a picture from a plant sale at the California Botanic Garden. And I love the plant sale at the California Botanic Garden. But if we are thinking about not just replacing one or two plants, if we're thinking about doing a significant landscape renovation and want to end up with a nice garden design, the problem with hitting the nursery and grabbing what catches your eye is that the vast majority of gardeners, even if they really know their plants well, what I see happening is people get one of this and two of that and maybe three of those and they bring them home and it doesn't always match really the, the needs of the space perfectly. Sometimes people will bring something home and it had a really beautiful flower in the one gallon pot, but then they realize it's gonna be 12 feet wide and the space is only six feet wide. And so it'll look great for a year, but then needs to really keep getting hacked back and is, is not going to look great after that. Or oftentimes people who have maybe more part shade than full sun might come home with too many plants that want full sun. Uh, there's just so many different ways that you can really end up with a hodgepodge garden. And so some of you in this workshop are native plant enthusiasts. If a hodgepodge garden and a one of this, one of that collection is what you want for your landscape, then that's fine. I'm not telling you you shouldn't do that. But most of the people that I end up working with and most of the people who come to these workshops don't want a collector's garden. Most of them want a nice looking garden that supports habitat as well and has beauty and is maybe working with native plants and doesn't need to be watered much. But even if you want that collector's garden, you can use these design principles that we'll be talking about to help kind of hold that together aesthetically. Uh, so my front yard's more of a bit of a traditional garden design still with high plant diversity with native plants. My backyard is more of a collector's garden, but we do our best to use some of the design principles we'll talk about in order to kind of help hold it together. So if we're not going to start at the nursery for inspiration or start with individual plants for inspiration, where do we start? So my suggestion is maybe starting at a wild area near you. And the reason why I say that is not because I want my backyard to look exactly like this. Uh, I don't. However, there is lots of inspiration to be found from our local wild areas. 
And so for me, the local wild area is the San Gabriel Mountains. And one of the things that I like to do is occasionally go out into a local area of the mountains during the summer when it's hot and dry and hasn't rained for many months and see what looks good out there and see what I can learn about that for how we might use certain plants in our landscape designs. And so this are this is some pictures uh, that I took on a walk during our last quote historic drought, uh, maybe about six years ago now. And I went out in August to see what was looking good out there, what's keeping itself alive without any human work and what's surviving just fine. So important things to note for our designs, in addition to just maybe talking about some of the cool plants out there is look at the plant density and also what's on the ground in these different areas, what's below the plants. So this is a walk I took in the upper Arroyo area above uh, Pasadena, Altadena area up near JPL, if any of you know that area, a beautiful canyon up there has some areas that are a little bit more shaded, some areas that are riparian, but a lot of full blasting sun areas. So immediately walking up along an asphalt road and reflected heat in August, uh, native coffee berry, looking pretty lush, new growth and, and doing just fine. Coffee berry is one of my favorite structural wooden shrubs or woody shrubs for native landscapes. I think it's underused. It can take sun to shade and just looks good year round. Uh, California fuchsia growing in, doing just fine. Uh, even coast live oak perched on the very edge, not a lot of soil there, uh, growing nice new growth in the middle of this quote, historic drought. So these plants and our landscape, we're still generally gonna maybe water them once a month, depending on the plant, maybe once every three weeks in the summer to keep things looking a little bit fresher. But these plants are really, really adapted to our local area. One of the great ways, reasons to work with them. Mountain mahogany, beautiful feathery seeds. Datura, this is very gorgeous, very toxic plant. A lot of people won't use this in a home landscape, but just showing how lush of a look that you can get. If you don't have any kids or domestic animals, uh, maybe one to consider letting go with the wildflowers in the backyard. Here we have Molozma up, you know, perched. This is facing west, reflected heat. Look at how green and beautiful that is. And then on the ground in a kind of area where there's more organic matter built up, uh, aster, gorgeous. And we're going to talk about plant lists uh, as well. So don't worry about you know, writing down all of these plants. These are just kind of general examples of really appropriate stuff near us. A uh, toyon, another one of my favorite woody plants. For gardens, this can also get pruned up into a small tree. Sugar bush, another underutilized, really beautiful evergreen shrub that can also get pruned up to be a multi-trunk kind of mini tree. And California buckwheat, which thrives pretty much everywhere in hot inland Southern California. And so at thinking about the ground covers, we have a whole range of ground covers everywhere from a bit more organic, where there's trees nearby with leaf litter to these California fuchsias and tiny little baby sagebrushes thriving in what's basically decomposed granite and gravel. When you get to the oak woodland area and it's so nice and cool, shade can be so important. And here we have that almost, uh, it's all leaf litter, but what's a little bit more like wood chip mulch, but it's not wall to wall. You know, there's rocks and a little bit more open areas as well. And then a little small big berry manzanita. Look at that beautiful new growth in the middle of August in the drought right path side. Still have things like sagebrush coming up. And so one way to think about starting with California native landscape design is ask yourself, is there a local plant community that you've seen, you visited on hikes that you really personally love the feel of. And maybe you're not going to want to have a totally naturalistic garden, but maybe taking that feel, taking a base of some of those plants and then abstracting that into a home garden and then mixing in other appropriate plants as you want. And so really important to understand our local plant communities. For those of you in inland Southern California who are brand new to native plants, huge, Huge important thing 
If you're in the Inland Empire, if you are in the San Gabriel, San Fernando Valley, you will hear politicians and other people who know better saying, well, this area is a desert. Area is not a desert. This area is a Mediterranean climate. Some of you joining us might be out in the true desert, but most of you are not gonna be in the desert. Uh, we're Mediterranean climate defined by hot, dry summers and cooler in a good year, wet winters. But most of our rainfall does come in the winter, even on a bad rain year. And here are our main local plant communities that we might abstract for home gardens if we live in this area. Oak woodlands. If you have room to plant an oak tree, uh, do it. The microclimate underneath an oak tree is so much cooler on a hot day than the rest of, of a yard or the urban area. It makes a huge difference. But a woodland effect, even if you don't have room for the oak tree, uh, defined by shade, some plants that can handle the shade underneath, uh, deep mulches of leaves and decomposing organic matter, so equivalent of wood chips with some stone. The soil part of it, because of all that organic matter, has, has a pretty active fungal presence, which can be built up with that organic matter over time. And it's a sheltering, cooling kind of place. So for example, I'll share pictures from my front yard later. I didn't have room for an oak tree in my front yard unless I wanted it to be my whole front yard. And in this case, I didn't. But that was a large part of the inspiration for the choices we did eventually make. Chaparral is one of our other local native plant communities. And largely that's all the stuff growing on the inland slopes, foothills of the San Gabriel mountains up to the kind of higher elevations. Uh, eventually you get to forest and it's a mix of trees and shrubs. But even in this dry, rocky area, you know, look at this plant diversity, the plant density, you know, almost Everywhere where there can be plants growing, there is. There's some spaces in between. You can see lower down. And there's right underneath the plants, there's an accumulation of leaves and organic matter. But in between, it's kind of decomposed granite and rocky, uh, but lots of diversity, lots of colorful flowering shrubs, uh, some succulents like this uh, Our Lord's Candle, Hespero Yucca mixed in, sculptural effect and lots of different variations of color of leaf. And then you also get your shrubs, your sages and your sage brushes and really great smelling stuff mixed in. And there's lots of different flavors of chaparral uh, everywhere from kind of more lush areas where you can see this clematis to really rocky areas where there's almost a dwarfing effect, mixture of sage and California buckwheat to much more dense areas. Uh, so this dominated by Ceanothus. And so in our yards, you know, you're not gonna want this, but maybe a combination of this with some extra accents from large Ceanothus could be a, a beautiful way to go. Here are just a couple of examples starting to mix in of landscape designs uh, that I've done using some of these concepts. So this was a berm area outside an auditorium at the Huntington Library that was a full blasting sun area. And we didn't want a lot of height, but we wanted simple and what can take the sun. So working with kind of dwarf ground cover versions of the chaparral plant. So a ground cover black sage and a ground cover, this is Montera sagebrush, uh, a Canyon Prince wild rye, and then oaks in the background. So kind of abstracting that, simplifying it and making our landscape goals happen, but still with a very kind of analog to a natural plant community. Here, there's kind of more diversity, but still kind of a chaparral, uh, shrubs from California, as well as other areas inspired, and then surrounding it with a semi-formal hedge to kind of hold that into an intentional landscape kind of feel. But definitely inspired by that shrubby chaparral diversity. Oak savanna, this is one of my favorites to me. Oak savanna is where it feels right to be a human. Uh, and if someone's looking for just a pretty uh, simple, really easy to maintain landscape design, uh, oak trees or large shrubs, things like toyon uh, with some space in between, working with grasses and other perennial plants is a great way to go. This is Santa Rosa Plateau, which is one of my favorite places in Southern California. and. A bench underneath an oak tree in the shade is one of the 
most pleasant places to be in Southern California. It's a landscape design done by Bernard Trainer, who is uh, active on mostly the central coast. And he does some very naturalistic landscapes, very high end properties. But if you look at what's going on underneath, a couple of oak trees, a mixture of yarrow and native grasses, and then a few small shrubs growing in, this is not an expensive landscape for someone to plant in a backyard space necessarily. Uh, and it's just gorgeous as it grows in. Here was just a picture from a mini backyard meadow in a place that my partner and I formerly rented. So some native grasses and then some perennials like this blue eyed grass kind of seasonal color. And then riparian landscapes. So we might not do a true riparian landscape unless we're connected to like a gray water system in our backyards, but they are lush kind of really nice places to be even when the water starts to dry out. And then thinking about the kind of the aesthetic of the riparian area, which can be emulated with a dry stream bed that maybe takes water off of your roof in the rainy season. And then that transition from kind of shrubbier, taller plants near it to a little bit of a drier area next to it. And so that can be emulated uh, without needing to use a ton of water in a built landscape. So kind of simple meadow working with rocks and then some trees and large shrubs to grow in. And so now we're going to talk about a little bit about how to start abstracting that, right? Because some people are going to really like that naturalistic approach, and that's a very great way to go. Uh, but a lot of people more want to mix in an eclectic mix of this plant and that plant. That's what I end up doing in most of the gardens that I build and design, but they're often inspired by plant communities. So here's a couple of approaches. The first one is, is really straightforward. Deciding on a concept or feel you want to achieve, match that to a local plant community, and then figure out the best plants to meet your goals. And if you're thinking about kind of mimicking a local plant community, what you're going to want to do is then do some research on what are the plants that grow in that community that are also easy and well behaved in a home garden. And in most cases, some of them will be and some of them won't be. So that's going to help you narrow down your plant choices. And if you're going for that naturalistic approach, you don't necessarily need to have a, a huge, huge uh, plant diversity, especially if you have a, a smaller, medium sized space, it might be no more than uh, 10 to a maximum of 20 different types of plants, including the tree, shrub and Ground cover species could be no more than 10, could be even less if, if you're going to meet your goals with fewer. Uh, totally up to you and what works for you. The other thing you can do is fall in love with plants and then design them into the right spaces, but really making sure you research where they like to grow and we'll provide you with those resources and focus on putting the right plant into the right place. And so basically, if you're doing that, you're going to be creating your own plant community. And thinking through like what do plant communities have so if you want some shelter you're going to be finding the right tree for your space you're going to be thinking about shrub layer you're going to be thinking about uh, ground cover layer but also let those natural plant communities inspire you so for the most part you know it's not one of this and one of that and one of this and one of that if you want a coherent looking design that's if, if you want to have a collector's garden totally up to you but for most people if you want to have a coherent looking design you can think about the fact that you're going to be kind of repeating things. You're going to have one or two trees in the average size yard, uh, uh, three to five different shrubs, maybe, maybe more if you want. And then maybe, you know, three to five or seven different ground covers and then working with them in groups, repeating, maybe some rocks in between. Uh, but, but keeping it simpler for most people is going to be more successful than getting crazy complex unless you specifically want to be complex. So here is one example of a, just kind of ground it before moving on, of a oak woodland landscape design that I did. This was a picnic area at the Huntington Library and Botanical Gardens. Kind of, we wanted to be naturalistic, California native. So we worked uh, creating this design of kind of modular, use it however you want seating area with boulders, and then using some soil to create some raised mounds. And eventually, it's to grow in to be an oak woodland with a lot of shade, we want shade in Southern California. Uh, but day one, even if you're bringing in uh, box trees, and these were three foot box trees, which is larger than reasonable to plant. Uh, normally I would not plant anything larger than one gallon, uh, maybe for an oak tree, a, a deeper tree liner, or maybe a five gallon plant. 
Uh, the smaller plants are going to grow faster, but here it was kind of a larger budget project with a donor who wanted to donate larger trees. So that's what we went with. But even that, the expensive three foot box trees that need to be put down with a bobcat, you know, they look huge when you're standing next to them and then you get them out in the landscape and there's no shape. So what we needed to do, even though it's an oak woodland concept, is we're working with working with plants that are also in the ecotone area. So meaning uh, that are gonna grow in the, the really sunny areas outside the oak woodland. So bringing in some kind of chaparral species. And so this is February, 2015, uh, just giving you that as a baseline so you can see how things grow in if they get off to a good start. So working with a combination of grasses, shrubs, perennials, and here's August of the same year, off to a good start. So the oak trees have grown some, but you can see uh, bush sunflower, sages, grasses growing in. Some things get going a little bit slower. This is a toyon that will grow in, buckwheat, sagebrush in the back, and a pretty naturalistic plant community, kind of a, a random scattering, just kind of massing really, making choices of where we want things larger, to provide a little bit more density and then smaller plants at the edge. Some narrow leaf milkweed, monarch butterfly showed up right away. Native asters as well. So smaller plants at the edge. So even in a naturalistic garden to make it feel a little bit more uh, fitting in a residential space, close to the edge, smaller plants, middle ground, medium sized plants, background, larger sized plants. Plenty of reasons to have exceptions to it, but if you're just kind of getting started, decent thing to think about. And in any landscape, even with a professional installation and, and garden staff, there's always something that's gonna die. Don't beat yourself up about it, plant something else. And if it's really hot, now they wait till fall and plant something else. So working with some grasses, and so well on its way. And then eventually over time, uh, the goal was, and I haven't been back there in quite a while, uh, but the goal was basically as the oaks grow in and start to shade, some of these plants are gonna have to get removed, but then we're gonna have the dominance of the oak canopy, which is just fine. Uh, a number of the plants can take the transition to part shade, like this uh, blooming aster right here. Uh, some of them are more full sun plants that would need to come out over time. And then one, Next thing to sort of guide us and ground us is consider creating a story or a stated concept for your garden. So uh, the creating a story for your garden, I got that from Mike Evans, uh, who runs Tree of Life Nursery, who is a brilliant plant person, and he can come up with these very kind of poetic stories for a garden. I'm more uh, just kind of thinking of a concept because I'm less of a poetic kind of person. Whatever works for you is great, but kind of sticking to a concept I find really helps in addition to a plant community. So for example, because my street had no street trees and felt really hot and dry when I was thinking about the front yard for the place my partner and I currently live in Pomona, I knew that I kind of wanted a woodland feel or when things grow in. Uh, but then we even started to think of our house as a bird blind and really framing what species we put where and even elements like uh, a large diameter branch that we had dig, dug partially into the ground, sticking out and specifically putting it right in the right location where we can see it from a specific room to kind of have that effect of a bird blind. And, and as, as we got that concept, we've developed where we put different features and different plants in our landscape specifically to capture those views of the birds kind of at their best or the most bird action. So that concept has driven our design. And then our backyard concept is it is a native plant collection. We're both professional horticulturists and we having a very diverse plant collection while still trying to hold it together aesthetically is something that lets us learn more about plants every year and try different plants. We also have a lot of fruit trees, uh, but the understory of those fruit trees is a native meadow where some of the native plants that can take a little bit more water and be compatible with the fruit trees grow there and really extends the habitat and bloom season in the summer as things dry out. And then we have vegetable gardening areas. And then remember another crucial thing that sometimes uh, first time gardeners, especially when they get really excited about plants, sometimes forget. And I love plants and I'm always needing to balance it myself in my home garden is if gardens are habitat for people, they also need space for people. So gardens need an entrance 
you want to be able to get in there and walk around, whether it's to check things out or do your garden care. And pads and other features can also help really help define the planted areas. Remember to give yourself a, self a space to sit and observe your garden as well. And so with that, we're going to start to transition to talking more about kind of the different elements of garden design. Uh, but it's a time for us to stop. And I see a ton of questions have come in. So I'm going to review those. I know a number of questions have come in on the chat as well. I just want to remind people, please put them into the Q&A because that's the one that I can really monitor with how it looks like to me on the back end of the Zoom. Uh, questions in the chat kind of tend to get a little bit buried. Uh, so if you want to retype your questions into the q and I will try to get to those. At the end, I'll review the chat and try to answer everything as well. Uh, okay, so some of these I will answer later. So Anita had a great question about the ratio of empty spaces to fully grown and matured sized plants. We're going to talk about plant density later on. Uh, from Sarah, how much of your choice of plant community is determined by the national natural geographic location of your property. Uh, a, that's a really good question. Uh, I would say you have some flexibility. So some people will say, uh, try to figure out the, the native plants that would have grown like specifically on your property and plant those. And if you are passionate about that, that is a legitimate way to go. But I will say like, for example, for my property, uh, kind of really loamy with some good amount of gravel, kind of historical floodplain area, I would guess that there would not have been a woodland on my specific property. However, oak trees and our local woodland plants grow really well. Uh, and it, being in an urban area now with heat island, I find that there's a lot of utility to planting more woodlands in our urban areas. And so I am all for that, even though, you know, right on my property, those oak trees might not have grown, but within a few miles, they would have. So in general, uh, making an exception, if you want to, uh, thinking about a regional approach. So I will take plants from the local foothills or concept designs from the local foothills and put them in, in our urban areas. Absolutely. Uh, no problem at all. I even like to mix in a good number of uh, desert plants from a number of miles farther east in California as well, because we are hot inland where I am. Those desert plants thrive. Those plants also will bloom a lot longer into the summer than some of our truly local native plants. And with the urban heat island effect in especially reflected heat areas like along a driveway, uh, and there's arguably it's more like a desert condition than a uh, local condition as well. So you can get creative with it, but thinking about uh, what makes sense in your local region, I think is a really good way to go. Uh, okay, so how much does slope change my decisions? Uh, a little bit, I will say, uh, with slope, if you're in an urban wildland interface area, you are going to have to think a lot more about, because often slopes come together, you're going to have to think more about wildfire. Oftentimes with slopes come fire concerns, and that goes, that's a whole other workshop. There's lots of good information online. Uh, Theodore Payne Foundation for Native Plants has put out a lot of great information about wildfire in the last few years and, and your garden. Uh, so definitely look into that if that is a consideration. Uh, but with slope, you're going to be thinking about a mixture of large shrubs or trees, uh, smaller shrubs, and some ground covers to have different rooting patterns and densities to hold that slope together. But you can still have a woodland, chaparral, sage scrub, uh, or deserty kind of slope. Uh, okay, so some of these that are really specific questions about disease and things like that, I will try to get to those at the end. But if I answer all of these questions, uh, we're not going to uh, get anywhere. So the specific ones I'll save till the end, but some general ones. So Patty is asking, if you build it, they will come. Where will they come from? Uh, talking about the native plants. Are they already in your garden feeding on non-native plants, but not really thriving? I don't know all the answers to that, Patty. Uh, some of them are specialists, but even some of those specialists, uh, you know, there's not a lot of native gardens in my, my area. Uh, we're trying to encourage more of them to be built. 
but I, I'm amazed at, at where they come from. Sometimes, like some of the birds that are more mobile that seasonally will migrate, or even some of the butterflies that seasonally will migrate, will find your yard and use it as a stopover in between wider natural areas. Uh, so for example, where we are, even though we're dense urban areas, we have the San Gabriel Mountains to the north, we have Prado Basin and Chino Hill State Park to the south. And so maybe some from there, but some of the native pollinators, uh, you know, they don't come from that far away, but I've seen the craziest native wasps and native bees, even in just a little patch of habitat in downtown Los Angeles. So I'm constantly amazed, but I don't really know the scientific answer to all of that. Uh, so some more specific questions. Well, for those of you asking about specific plant choices, we will go over those choices later. Planting under oak trees is, I'll just answer this quickly as we go. Planting under oak trees is definitely doable. You just want to find the right plants to uh, do that. And there are lists online for wherever your area is of you know, Northern California, Southern California, uh, what to plant under oak trees. Uh, I believe Las Palitas Nursery, Las Palitas Nursery has a good one. And I will share some of that in some of our resources. Uh, there was one. Uh, will this be, yes, yeah, so this is being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel, which is up towards the top of the chat later. And then the one other thing also, so at the other link at the top, uh, for those of you who join later, cbwcd.org slash presentations, you'll be able to download a PDF with all of the slides. Okay, so, and then last question for now, from RP, will we discuss troubleshooting why a plant is not thriving? We're going to talk a lot about putting the right plant in the right place, which in general is the most important thing. But because this is a class focused on design, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about troubleshooting. If you stay on till the end in the final question and answer, well, I'll have more time to kind of go over everything and answer kind of more tangential questions. I'd be happy to try to help you out, however. Okay, so. Let's move on. And we're going to be talking about elements of landscape design, but you will start seeing in some of these elements of landscape design slides, uh, photo credits that go to the Theodore Payne Foundation's Native Plant Garden Tour. They have generously allowed me to use uh, here both my pictures from their garden tour as well as their own pictures, especially. So I wanted to quickly thank them and also mention it, them as a resource for landscape design inspiration. Every spring, they have an amazing two-day garden tour where you get to see homes across Southern California. One day is usually more inland, kind of valleys northeast through like Northeast LA, uh, San Gabriel through San Fernando valleys, uh, very directly applicable for Inland Empire areas as well. And then the other day is more LA city to sometimes the more coastal areas. Uh, so I definitely highly recommend that, but also on their website for the garden tour at nativeplantgardentour.org, you can go back and look at amazing photos of all of the home landscapes that have been on the tour in the past number of years. So it's a great place to find inspiration for the approaches to gardening and even like patio spaces and pathways and materials that you might be interested in. Whole wide range of sizes and styles. So really cool resource. Uh, and it's going to be a mixture of their pictures and then other pictures like this one from my backyard when it was in construction. So we're going to go through a list of basic elements of landscape design. So we're going to back up and we're going to talk about things that don't have, well, actually they do have stuff to do with plants, but they're not directly plant-based. And your plants are going to be kind of the layer on top of this. But these are some of the, the most fundamental things to be aware of and be thinking about if you're first starting to think about kind of the designy aspects of landscape design. One of the most crucial one is landform, the, the contours, the slopes, the elevations that your landscape takes. And thinking about, are you to achieve the goals you're gonna set for your garden, going to be moving soil around to do different things because you need to do that before you put your plants in the ground. Uh, so one of the most common ones in Southern California is, digging soil out and moving it or mounding it up to control what happens to the water when it comes on your property, whether it's controlling for flooding issues or turning rainwater into the precious resource that it is. And so this is a picture of my backyard. 
in the middle of construction where we had started to dig out and create a pathway for water, which would flood at the front of our house because there's a slight slope that goes from the front yard towards the house and around. We dug out a trench that we filled with gravel, also called a French drain, to bring that water around the house and then let it open up into what would eventually become a dry stream bed. And finally, that water in a big enough storm event would flood this sunken meadow that we set up with uh, Western meadow sedge, a native grass-like plant. And then we took all of that soil that we dug out from that and mounded it up. So instead of a gentle slope, we created a usable patio space of recycled broken concrete that we broke up from our other patio space, which was in bad shape, uh, made some stepping stones. And then we created just with the rock that we had dug up, a series of little kind of somewhat flatter planting terraces. And then this larger terrace area which created enough of a gap to then have like a built-in uh, seating wall, also made with recycled broken concrete, and really creating much more interest and in levels in the space as well, which at first glance, uh, before we had moved into the space, just looked like a very gentle slope. So we got a more dynamic landscape. We got a little bit, especially with trees growing in, a sunken kind of shadier microclimate. And now we really can control what happens with the water. So what you do with your site in terms of those landform might not be that extreme, but it's the time to think about what opportunities will you have. If you're interested more in that water capture, we have an entire workshop with a recording online that we teach called Rainwater Harvesting for Home Landscapes, and actually use this property as a case study, as well as many more examples of all the different options you have to turn that rainwater into a resource and what you need to do to make that happen. Here's kind of a smaller example, but a classic example of, this is a relatively narrow side yard, you can see the, the wall of the building here. And what was done is maintained a pathway for access to create some planting bed for some great native shrubs, which get a little bit of trimming, I can tell, but still look pretty nice and natural to leave space for the pathway. And then right next to it is an area that could soak in the rain, a little bit of a sunken dry stream bed working with rocks and gravel of different sides. And then the soil that came out of that is mounded on the downslope side to create a greater pooling capacity here. And it also burns it up a little bit more from the street so that the shrubs on top of it provide a little bit more of a sense of privacy in the garden. Great approach. One thing to keep an eye on, we talk about this a lot in the Rainwater Harvesting for Home Landscapes workshop is if you are doing something like that, which is a great idea, just make sure that the, the height of the total pooling of the water in a big storm event would never leave water flooded and soaking at the foundation of your building. You wanna make sure that there's always gonna be an overflow that will let the water out and on its way before it would flood up against the building. So that's basically thinking about that sculpting of the landscape, whether you're gonna be moving a little soil or a lot, if you're digging out soil, figure out what to do to keep that soil on site and create some mounds or berms that contribute or even just add visual interest. Uh, if you have clay soil, those mounds or berms will also be areas where you might be able to sneak in some plants that need better drainage. We'll talk about drainage and plant selection later on. Other really critical elements of landscape design is understanding your exposure. That means really understanding what areas you have that are full sun, part shade or shady and your microclimates, which are any particularly hot or cold areas. So exposure, if you see that plants say that they want full sun, that means six or more hours of direct sunlight throughout most of the year. So that doesn't need to be full blasting sun, sun up to sundown. And in a lot of areas that could be you know, sun until you know, early afternoon and then shade in the afternoon or, or even sun until noon. Most of the, the full sun plants will still work in hot inland Southern California. Microclimates, those particularly hot or cold areas, a uh, couple of examples. One very common in inland areas is that reflected heat off the driveway, uh, near the sidewalk, or especially up against like a stucco kind of uh, wall or a block wall, reflected heat. Uh, those in inland are sometimes a default way to go for me is gonna be to push more towards plants that grow in hot chaparral areas or even true desert areas. Occasionally I'll work with someone that has a, extra cold microclimate. So for example, I helped some people who have a landscape backyard that's at the base of one of the hills in Chino Hills. And in the winter, cold air pools down to their backyard and has nowhere to escape. So they get more frost. And so working with them, they had to do actually a little bit of extra research on making sure that plants could, could handle low temperatures because a lot of the plants around here uh, never have to handle those lower temperatures. Example of an approach mixing native and 
uh, non-native succulents for a hot microclimate. And then here's just one example. So Palmer's mallow is one of my favorite flowering native shrubs, great habitat plant, not native locally to where I am in Pomona, true desert plant, but just thrives in our inland heat and can take that reflected heat and turn it into flowers throughout a lot of the summer. Another microclimate to think about using creatively is if you have a cooler, moister area. So this is an example of the water feature in me and my partner's backyard, uh, just a old galvanized horse trough, horse trough that someone was happy to give to us that they weren't using, filled it up, put a cheap fountain pump in it, and just an extension cord, uh, have some native water plants in it. But there, there's just a little bit of splash onto the north side of this water feature, and there's a large shrub turned pruned up into a small tree next to it. So it's a shady, slightly moister area. And here we can grow some native plants that aren't gonna thrive out in our main landscape or seasonally would look uh, quite parched. And they do really well year round in this moister microclimate. Repetition is one to really consider as a visual aspect to tie together elements of your garden, if you want to make it look just a little bit more garden-esque, especially if you have a really high plant diversity garden. So uh, I really like this example for it is you can tell here, it's a really pretty diverse garden, uh, might look a little bit wild to some people, might look just fine to some people, but there's a few plants that the designer chose to repeat which makes it have almost a slightly formal garden element. So these beautiful sulfur buckwheats, one, two, three. And then this Cleveland sage, looks like it might be Winifred Gilman sage. There's one over here and one over here. And then you can also see the repetition of the red flower and Caliandra. So those repeated elements really provide a, a sense of loose structure, and then everything else can kind of go wild with the plant diversity, and it holds things together just a little bit. So that may or may not be a priority for you, but if you're thinking about how do you balance the beautiful kind of chaos that, that can be visually seen in a native garden with a little bit more of feeling like a design space, uh, repetition is really a great way to do it. Or repetition to the extreme, which is massing. So here, uh, this is an entrance landscape that I did the planting design for where we had an existing tree. And really this was an area for people to just kind of walk by quickly and take in something that looked kind of nice. And so worked with uh, mostly native deer grass, planted about four, four and a half feet apart. And then some gaps in between where we just mixed in a native sage or a buckwheat here or there. Very simple lots of habitat value and visually very cohesive. I could see you know, most of a front yard uh, being that easily for a very low maintenance and quite striking front yard. And then little elements of surprise. So if you're working with massing and then you wanna have little moments of you know, joy or a little more garden-esque elements, then just little bits of surprise here and there can be a way to do it. So just one example is in a, part shady area in the rock wall in my backyard, just mixing in a Deblia, our native succulents, and uh, basically don't need to think about it very much as long as it's well sited with enough afternoon shade. And, uh, you know, beautiful, it's kind of something that catches your eye. Uh, and yeah, a little bit of surprise for people who are visiting the garden for the first time. And now we're going to kind of get into some little bit more garden, true garden design, plant design -y sorts of stuff. One key way to have a kind of designy looking landscape, whether you have high plant dense uh, diversity or uh, kind of a more restricted plant diversity is to think about contrasts between plants that are going to be next to each other. And those contrasts can be texture or color. So texture is in many ways, almost more important than color. And by texture, it's the effect of the plant by the shape of the leaf and to some degree by the distribution or density of the leaf. And so for example, here you can see in the front, the ferny leaf of the yarrow that's in front of the larger triangular leaf of the hummingbird sage that's next to the grass, it's a very different texture, the deer grass next to it. And that is 
also offset by the long, kind of more sparse leaves on the showy penstemon, which I like to use kind of in between the deer grass where you don't see it a lot of the year and then it just comes into bloom and then the kind of billowy texture of all the flowers. So even though we're seeing a lot of greens, a lot of different textures provides a little bit of contrast and pop for the actual landscape design. Grasses have amazing textures here as well. So alkali sacaton, get billowy uh, kind of texture, and then the small leaves of the penstemon, and then the larger leaves of the toyon and the western redbud in the back. And that textural contrast can go a long way. And so here you can also see talking about repetition. Here we're trying to balance repetition of the grasses using a couple different species with deer grass in the back where we wanted kind of a thicker presence of the grass to provide a little bit more privacy to the space. And then working with the alkali sacaton, which is a smaller grass, but still kind of forms an element of visual repetition because they share so much of a texture and then having the smaller colorful accents and more diversity in between. And then color, when we're thinking about color contrast, uh, leaves with their colors, I think of as more important than flower color. Flower colors are going to come and go throughout the seasons. And my personal philosophy is if we have the well-selected plants and the right amount of diversity in our gardens and maybe tossing in a few wildflowers, like here you can see California poppies and clarkias in between some of the plants, the colors are just going to work themselves out. Uh, you, If you want to focus on flower color, you are welcome to. But what I like to think about in terms of the design aspect is leaf color, because we have so many different leaf colors with our native plants from our dark greens to our medium greens to our grays to our almost whites that if you are trying to have that aspect of visual design in your garden and it's up to you whether or not you value that as a priority for you in your space but if you're trying to have that that contrast between the for example like the light leaf color of this desperado sage hybrid in the front versus the more traditional green or medium green of the California bush sage right next to it or the monkey flower, that's going to pop year round. Uh, whereas the flower color is going to come and go. And I've seen landscape designs where people think so much about flower color and forget that the fact that one of them is going to be flowering more in the fall and one of them is going to be flowering more in the spring. So think about flower color if you want to, but I like to let the flower colors kind of work themselves out. So here, for example, uh, purple flowers next to purple flowers, but if you look at them, there's there's still a lot of difference between these kinds of purples. So I still see a, a contrast and the iridescence of the Margarita Bot Penstemon with their blues is even more of a contrast with the softer purple of the Margar or the Delamine of Verbena uh, when you see it in person. Next important concept to think about is the concept of hydrozone. So this is not visual, but this is really important in terms of how you put together your landscape and your plant choices, which will impact those visual aspects. So hydrozones is basically just carefully grouping plants with similar moisture needs together. And I'd like to use this example of a semi-native front yard where you can see that the main landscape area has a combination of deer grass, manzanita, and there's some other non-native Mediterranean plants as well. All low water use plants that can take a bit of summer irrigation in this area. And this person, maybe they're from the Northeast or more temperate area, obviously liked and valued uh, a couple of higher water use plants the hydrangea and the Japanese maple, but they are grouped well together in the shade right next to each other where they can get extra water either from a different valve on their irrigation system or because it's so small, just with a, a hose uh, as needed. So in general, what you're going to want to do, especially if you have an automatic irrigation system where you're setting up a large area sprinkler with the hose is make sure that all your plants are gonna want the right frequency and amount of irrigation to be grown together. Or if you're gonna have pockets that need more moisture, I have a plan to supplement them. So for example, in my front yard, most of it gets watered all together once every three to four weeks in my young woodland area. But I do have uh, some areas of yarrow and hummingbird sage, which because the shade hasn't grown in yet, still get full blasting afternoon sun. 
And so if I'm watering, you know, during the time of year where I'm watering once a month, if it's hot in the front, I'll get out there with a the hose and do a little supplemental watering on just those couple of plants, which I have pretty close to where I can access them with the hose and just keep those looking a little bit happier. So even though it's a little bit mixed, I have the plan and know that I'm going to do that work and I'm just fine with that. And then over time, as the shade grows in, I might not even need to do that. And then it is not all or nothing or super cut and dry. Uh, so as long as you think out a plan, that would be just fine. So this is a hot Western facing uh, Van Nuys, Southern California garden, a uh, mix of mostly native smaller plants and shrubs with a few uh, Mediterranean climate ones, but then there's a few fruit trees. And so in this, we worked with drip irrigation zones. So there's one main drip irrigation zone that does the main area, one that does the parkway area, and then a third one that is just extra inline drip tube that's wrapped underneath the canopies of the fruit trees right out to the edge. And so those fruit trees are able to get that little bit of extra supplemental water that they need to push it more into the medium water use category and keep them happy and productive. So even though the hydrozone isn't directly next to each other, uh, if you are working with drip irrigation, or even if someone was motivated to just bring out a small sprinkler or get out there with a hose on a trickle every once in a while, you can work creatively with your hydrozoning plan. Here's another example, a mix of native and non-native plants where there's a native carex or Western meadow sedge uh, meadow surrounded by areas of drier native plants. And so ideally those are going to be set up. I don't actually know how the irrigation was set up for this landscape, but ideally there's gonna be a moisture zone with more regular water because this meadow area is gonna want not a ton of water, but, but more often. And then the drier native areas in the surround can get water less often. And now as we keep going through the list, uh, some of so some of you if, you, if this is new to you, are going to be feeling maybe a little bit of, of information overload by now. And if you do, don't worry about it. Uh, one, you can rewatch this because it's recorded and it'll be posted to our YouTube channel. Uh, but the other thing is, even if you don't know exactly what to do with it yet, just the fact that you have thought about these things as concepts to think about, then when you're sitting down to actually do your landscape design or think about a project, you know, some of them are going to come back to you or you can look through the slides again and you'll be able to apply them. So even if you're not absorbing every single part of it, don't worry about it, uh, you're still gonna benefit. So someone had asked this earlier, how dense should the plants be? So here are some of my thoughts on plant density. Uh, first one is like a lot of things in landscape, it depends. Depends on what your goals are for the property. A lot of first time gardeners are a little bit intimidated to have a garden that's going to have a lot of plant density. But in most cases, if you don't have a reason to have big spaces in between the plants, you're going to want to plan to look up what the fully grown in size of your plants are going to be. And other than intentional pathways or access, you're going to want to have the vast majority of that landscape filled with plants or something, maybe uh, you might have a patio space, uh, you might have some rocks in open areas, but big spaces in between plants in general, unless you're really going for like a, a desert kind of garden effect, uh, don't much happen. If you're, if you're in the dense shade underneath a tree, you sometimes see that, but if it's full sun and there's soil available, something wants to grow there. And that's what we see in chaparral and coastal sage scrub areas, taking our cues from nature. But other than that, just practically, if you have a few plants and big open areas of wood chip mulch in between in the spring through early summer, as well as in the winter, uh, weeds are gonna wanna grow there. And so if you cover that area with your plants, not only will you have plants to look at, but you're gonna be oftentimes having lower maintenance and more habitat value and more blooms and beauty in the long run. So it's about not just putting in a bunch of plants, 
because then they could get very overgrown. But researching how wide the plants are going to get, realizing that they're going to get that wide and leaving that space for them to grow in and have their beautiful natural form. The, the, if they have the space for that natural form, they're going to look better. You're going to have to do a lot less kind of pruning and maintenance over time. So I like this front yard landscape that's on a pretty busy street corner in Pomona as an example, a mix of native and low water plants, uh, mixing in some succulents for effect, as well as some other uh, non-native Mediterranean climate plants, but pretty high plant density, but pretty simple. So they're working a lot with pigeon point coyote brush, which is just a calm green ground cover. They have some trees, they have some shrubs for accents, and eventually this coyote brush will grow closer to the edge, but leaving things a little bit more open or working with some smaller plants or seasonally some wildflowers on the edge is a nice thing to do. But then on their parkway strip, this is a pretty busy street. I'm sure all sorts of people park here. They're going to be opening and getting out of cars. And so instead of the wood chip mulch and high plant density, they're working with a decomposed granite layer, some gravel, and then a more sparse planting so that car doors could open people could walk through, but it's still very intentional with design. Nice use of rocks. Some of the rocks are buried part way to look a little more natural. You can see here, there's a, a white sage, or it might be a uh, Ancelia farinosa, a brittle bush. I don't remember what it was, honestly, uh, but something that can take that reflected heat and grab or decompose granite mulch. Uh, so very well thought out. So low plant density for a specific purpose, higher plant density as kind of a default. Here is on the left, there's another view from around the corner of this landscape, really nice layering of lower plants in the front, rocks in the open areas, and then medium height, there's a kind of loose informal hedge of Howard McMinn Manzanita, and then the tree layer in the background. Here on the right, you see another high plant density, uh, native, mostly native front yard landscape. This is one I photographed in Altadena, California. And here it's very shrubby, some smaller layers, but a nice gravel well-edged pathway with some nice stone walking through. So it's not kind of too overwhelming. It kind of frames the pathway very nicely. Another kind of higher plant density, really beautiful planting, mix of native and non-native plants. And then in the open areas, working with California poppies, as well. And so if this high plant density is not for you visually, that's fine. But as a default mode to kind of maximize the benefits of the native plants and to have less weeding to do, it's what I generally recommend that people go towards. I really like this front yard landscape that was designed by Tim Becker, who's the director of horticulture at Theodore Payne Foundation. And I will say that if you look at the plants here, some of them are younger and as they grow in, there is going to be more plant density, but for someone who's interested in having a little bit more open space for whatever reasons, they, this I think is a, is a good visual kind of way to go where we have a background of larger shrubs or small trees it's working with some fruit trees here and then some medium sized trees. So the Palo Verde is gonna grow in. And then there's a mixture of shrubs perennials, and then the open spaces look very intentional, mixing in some smaller plants and working with rocks, boulders, and also some little branches as well for habitat value and visuals. So this is a very nice naturalistic, you know, it's very different than just wood chip mulch or gravel, and then kind of wide space plants in between. Uh, here's another picture. So here, the lower density areas are a little bit of negative space and a little bit of breadth that, that intentionally kind of offsets and highlights some of the larger plants. So if you're thinking about lower plant density, I'd encourage you to not just have your lower plant density be blank areas of space, but that's part of an intentional design. Another way to be successful with lower plant density is make sure that you have shade and trees. So if you remember uh, some of the areas of oak woodland, some of them were very grassy. A lot of those grasses were non-native invasive grasses, but some of those areas where it's heavy leaf litter uh, are the plantings are more sparse, but it feels all right. And it also helps prevent excessive weeds if that's in the deep shade. So if you plant some trees, plant some large shrubs, 
And then that can give you an excuse for a little bit more open space and keep that low maintenance. And with that, we are going to move on to the importance of trees. I'm gonna give you a small rant on that, and then maybe we'll stop and answer some questions. And then eventually, probably closer to 11, we'll take a, a brief five minute break uh, somewhere in there. So the importance of trees. I work with a lot of people these days who are afraid of planting trees. Uh, people have a gripping fear that trees are going to break their sewer lines and destroy their patios. And I am here to tell you that if you site the right tree in the right place, and if it's not next to what's already a leaking uh, sewer line, you're probably gonna be just fine because trees are extremely important if we actually want to use or be comfortable in our outdoor spaces in inland Southern California. Plant a tree to the west of your patio space if you want to be using it in the afternoon or early evening, or even like in times of heat, like where we are right now, if you wanna be using that space before seven at night, you need some afternoon shade. So this is Catalina Island cherry. This is one of my favorite trees for right next to a patio space. It does drop some cherries, but they're not big moist cherries. They're kind of dry and mostly uh, seed, important uh, bird food, uh, but they grow quickly. They'll grow 25, 30 feet tall, and they don't get super wide, uh, 10, maybe 15 feet wide at the most in most gardens. And so you can get some shade quickly. You can even use a series of them for kind of a, a wall to provide some afternoon shade, maybe along a property boundary. And here's also a large manzanita, small shrub or small tree, large shrub. And then you can see there's a sycamore tree really providing shade over there. Uh, but plant trees, trees are an investment, uh, but necessary to have a pleasant space in a hot inland area. Uh, I wouldn't plant a huge tree right on top of my sewer line, but if your sewer line, a lot of housing stock has already had to have sewer lines replaced with modern uh, plastic sewer lines, or if you have a, a newer sewer line, uh, if it's not leaking already, it's not gonna get broken by a tree root, uh, but they, any plant will exploit a kind of a ready resource of leaking water. Uh, so, so that's kind of what to think about those. And, and if you plant a large tree, like a sycamore or an oak tree, every number of years eventually, uh, doesn't need to be all the time, every number of years, you, you might want the services of an arborist, but it, it's gonna add so much to your yard. Do not be afraid of planting trees. Uh, working with large shrubs, small trees, this is a street in Pomona where they burned up the soil a little bit and then planted a row of Western red buds. And just on a hot day, gorgeous, shade to the sidewalk looks beautiful from across the street relatively simple uh, some spaced grass in between uh, of a native species i think this was probably red fescue which is not always the easiest to grow but work here in the shade uh, but super simple planting plant low maintenance a lot of habitat and makes a lovely experience and here is a one of those you know somewhat lower density not wall-to-wall -wall plants uh, not a huge amount of plant diversity, but lovely front yard in Claremont, California, where they're working with that same just simple green pigeon point coyote brush. Beautiful repetition of this absolutely lovely Santa Cruz Island buckwheat. You can see some salvia no longer blooming, but uh, this is probably an Allen Chickering sage or a Pozo blue sage in the background. But this tree adds so much to it, provides some privacy to this large window and provides some interest up against the house, but this garden would look rather flat if this tree wasn't there. And so this Chitalpa tree, semi-native, one of its parents, it's a hybrid, is, is native, but used in a lot of gardens, uh, really helps make this garden space, which has you know, not a ton of plant density, not a ton of plant diversity, but is absolutely lovely, probably meets all of the goals of, of the family that lives here and has this lovely tree. If you have room for a shade tree, a, a huge tree, and you can plant a coast live oak in Southern California, uh, do it. Incredible habitat plant and just under the dense shade of an oak tree is the most pleasant place to be in summer, hands down outside. Uh, once that tree grows in, there's not a ton of different plants that are going to reliably thrive underneath that dense canopy, but one of them is right here. This is Catalina perfume or Ribes viburnifolium, uh, 
really in dense shade, one of the best kind of ground covers, low shrubs. And then in a patio space, here's an example of the California Botanic Garden, a single desert museum Palo Verde tree pruned up, just absolutely lovely. Trees make a big difference. So you already saw this picture, but now I'm gonna talk about it for a different reason. If it wasn't for these two trees, this garage and in turn the west side of this house would be much hotter in the summer. So thinking about your outdoor spaces, but thinking about shading the west side of your house or even part of the south side of your house with evergreen or deciduous shade and a coast live oak and a couple of chairs is pretty much a garden in and of itself. And remember that trees are really important to more than just humans, uh, both for cover, for nesting sites, absolutely essential for birds. And a lot of our trees will either produce food in abundance for birds, some of them for mammals as well, and then leaf material for caterpillar and moth larval host plants, which in turn, caterpillars are absolutely essential to bringing up most baby birds. Even if the adults feed on seeds, the vast majority of baby birds need lots and lots of caterpillars. So this is the oak tree in my backyard. This is the bird condominium complex for our backyard. The birds come out and eat on seeds and hunt for insects. But whenever they're scared or startled, they fly into the oak tree and come right back out. Many different species. Sometimes we'll have at least five or six different species in this relatively small oak tree at a time. And oaks are so important for so many different species, including lots of different caterpillar and moth species, which you might not ever see. But again, huge, huge bird food importance. And so on just one morning, for example, I got a picture of a goldfinch, hummingbird, and mockingbird all on the oak tree. And we have all sorts of other visitors all throughout the year. You have room for one large tree, plant a oak tree, and coast live oak would be the default choice in inland Southern California. And remember, trees take time. So if you're planting, plant them now. And then also remember that it's going to be sunny underneath for quite a while. So you're going to start with a full sun planting nearby and, you know, by year five, 10, uh, whenever you're starting to get real shade underneath, you're going to change out some of the planting underneath, uh, but it'll be quite a while and it'll be worth it when you arrive. If you're thinking about some of your other woody structural plants, you can work with plants that can take full sun or part shade. And I'll provide again later those resource sources and that way they'll survive the transition. But for smaller stuff, by the time the oak tree grows in, you're gonna probably be refreshing some of the smaller plantings anyways. And then the last designy design concept that we'll talk about before we start getting into kind of applying some of those and also looking at like examples of other spaces you might want to element. But the last concept we're going to talk about is concept called cues to care, which I think is very important to consider for real naturalistic landscapes, especially if they're in front yards and especially if you're concerned with what the neighbors think. You may or may not be. Uh, cues to care is a landscape concept or a landscape theory that was developed by a, an academic named Joan Nassauer. And she was working in a very different uh, ecosystem type where the native ecosystem was uh, more of a diverse prairie ecosystem. And people had started in her area uh, getting interested in taking out lawns and kind of doing more of like prairie restoration landscapes. Obviously, it wasn't everybody, just kind of a few people here or there, but they were starting to show up. And she became very interested in the reactions to those because sometimes they would go in in a neighborhood and they'd be seen as beautiful. Sometimes they would go in in an area and people would think that the lawn had been abandoned and it was bringing down the property value and it looked terrible. And the lawn was full of weeds. And so she embarked on a quest to figure out what's the difference? What makes that difference? And so she did a study with all sorts of visual simulations where she'd have the same landscape and just one thing or another thing would be changed. And then average people who don't know anything about plants would kind of rank them and, and give feedback about what they think about them. And not surprisingly, the conclusion at the end was that people either like or are perfectly tolerant of landscapes that they see as being intentional and cared for whether or not they have any idea what's going on with the plants and people tend to dislike or not want in their neighborhoods landscapes that they see as neglected 
and uncared for. And so because people might not be understanding what's going on with the plants, there are additional things that can be done to cue people in to the fact that these are intentional landscapes, even if the planting is kind of wild. Those are the cues to care. And so I like this landscape in a front yard in Van Nuys, California, as a example of what I see as great cues to care for a kind of wild side native front yard landscape. So if you look at the planting going on here, pretty wild along the front. And think about what this would look like if this split rail fence and these little kind of pretty intentional looking piles of rocks weren't there. To some people, it might look overgrown and abandoned. And I really think that the fence and the little piles of rocks, here it was for garden trees, just little labels, but even the stepping stone. And then once you get to looking down the pathway, the even though they're shrubs and they're kind of vibrant, uh, they've been appropriately pruned so that the path is not overgrown. It's a nice installed decomposed granite path with a couple of pieces of flagstone in it, aesthetic touches. There's not a bunch of weeds overgrowing the path. And then when you look farther down, there's flagstone used to develop this slightly raised planting bed. And then when you look back, there's this beautiful, well-maintained patio space. And so even though the plants are kind of a riot in the front, no one's going to mistake this for an unintentional, uncared for abandoned landscape. So your cues to care might be, might be uh, different, but just kind of thinking through if that appeals to you as part of your design, you know, what can you do if you like that very naturalistic approach to cue people in to the fact that you're doing something intentional. Uh, in addition to that, a number of organizations like the California Native Plant Society has a little metal yard sign that says native plants grow here. Uh, for example, I have a very naturalistic front yard, first one to go in, in the neighborhood. So right on the corner of the driveway, we have that native plants grow here sign. And then we also have the little sign that we got with uh, getting our yard certified with the National Wildlife Federation. That's a, a certified habitat, wildlife habitat yard, which kind of explains what's going on. And so those kind of cue people into what's going on with our very wild landscape in our front yard. So we're going to transition after we'll take a breath, answer questions, and then we'll talk about kind of native approaches to some traditional garden elements. We'll talk about lawns, shrubs, patio spaces, things like that. And we'll get a lot of kind of inspirational pictures. Uh, so let's answer some questions. Uh, what was the name of the plant that was doing well under the coast live oak? Uh, that was sometimes called Catalina perfume, sometimes called evergreen current, and for those of you who do uh, scientific plant names, Rives viburnifolium. Uh, okay, so from George, will the, so also a reminder, please, please type your questions into the Q&A. I just happened to catch a few of these in the chat, but I'm able to keep an eye on them uh, much better on the Q&A. And Bonnie uh, entered a link for Rives viburnifolium to the Calscape website that we'll talk about later. Thank you very much, Bonnie. That's awesome. So you can follow that link and bookmark that page if you're interested. Uh, so from George, will the tree roots of a medium big tree affect the foundation of the house? So I look into building code to figure out the depth of the foundation. Uh, you don't need to look into building code. Uh, basically for a medium large tree, ideally like an oak tree at least 10 feet away from your house, if not 15. And then also think about the branches and if you want branches kind of over your roof over time. Uh, so like an oak tree might be one more like in the center of the yard or out as a street tree, uh, but in most cases not right up against your house. Whereas smaller trees like a Palo Verde, for example, uh, I'd be perfectly comfortable with that uh, 10 feet from from my house. And, and it, the answer is always like, it depends. It depends on the existing state of your foundation, but I don't do trees right up against the foundation of the house. Uh, okay, let's see. Let's go to the Q&A. Uh, some of these are, will I address those questions later? Yes, I will be. Uh,
Okay, from Gordon, I was talking about the habitat value of oaks. Are scrub oaks as beneficial as trees? In terms of the habitat value kind of being that ecological hub for all of those species, uh, absolutely, absolutely scrub oaks, which are smaller shrubbier oaks. There's many uh, species that are native to California, depending on where you are. Uh, yes, you, you'll never get that shade canopy of the tree. Obviously there's less volume of tree, but certainly if you don't have room for a big oak tree, uh, planting one of the scrub oaks that's native to your general area is a great way to go to get that habitat value. Uh, so from Gary, uh, there was a question, is the Chitalpa tree too close to the house? Uh, again, it's always, it depends. Chitalpa is not a huge tree. It's almost one of those ones, especially, uh, so that one, which is the, the native hybrid. It's a hybrid with the desert willow, uh, Pink Dawn. I believe it's Pink Dawn or Pink Blush. I, th I think it's uh, Pink Dawn. Uh, not a huge tree. It's almost more of a shrub that is kind of pruned up into a tree. and it's not, doesn't ever get a huge, massive trunk like an oak. Uh, so I think that's probably within the safe zone, but it's all about what's going to be, what's going to feel safe for you. Uh, so for Trish, how about planting trees near around a septic system? Uh, I'll honestly say, so I've always worked in urban areas on city sewer, so I don't have a lot of experience with that, but I would say research trees that can take that water and you might think about trees that are also uh, kind of grow in riparian areas as well, but you might be careful. So there's a lot of great trees from riparian areas that can take a, a kind of constant trickle of water, but you might ask people locally, I would be hesitant to plant like either a cottonwood or an alder because they can spread clonally and have roots that come up uh, into sprouts where there is water. And I would hate for it to really kind of clog up your septic system by overloading it. Uh, okay, we have a lot of specific questions, which I will have to save a lot of those for the end. Guess the one related to a slide. Uh, plants that I, I've used with the deer grass, it would probably in that simple planting, uh, it was working with uh, Allen Chickering sage and just normal uh, California buckwheat in that particular planting. I also love uh, doing uh, showy penstemon in between deer grass because it kind of goes away a lot of the year and then pops up with brilliant, brilliant color until spikes. Okay. Okay, let's move on we will go through our garden elements and then we will take our brief break just going to grab a quick sip of water all right so moving on garden elements so native versions of all sorts of different things we might want to do in our garden uh Starting with a pretty traditional landscape, traditional lawn and shrubs. This is in the flowery time of year, but uh, there are a few native plants that if you just want a low green area, kind of in replacement of a traditional lawn, that can be your go-tos. And actually this last early spring, we have a turf plot demonstration of three small rectangles of turf alternatives at the Waterwise Community Center. And we replanted that with three of my favorite approaches, two of which are native. And we're really studying, really refining uh, the exact water demands in inland kind of full blasting sun, uh, Southern California. But they are yarrow, as you see here, which will just be green part of the year, can be mowed to stay green. And occasionally, if you let it, it'll flower brilliantly, kind of late spring, early summer, and then sporadically after that. If you are keeping it as a big lawn area, uh, cutting it back with a string trimmer. And one of the keys that I found with yarrow and big swatches like this is as much as I like to let yarrow really dry out and have all sorts of seed for the birds, I find that that's better to maintain yarrow that way for uh, kind of here and there throughout, throughout the garden. If you want a large 
contiguous area, right as the flowers start to fade while the flower stems are not hard and dry, I like to give it a good cut back then because once those flower stems get kind of dry and woody, uh, they're hard to get a, a good kind of clean cut back. Uh, but yarrow, uh, my other favorite go-tos are Western Meadow Sedge and Dune Sedge. For those of you who do scientific names, Carex pragracillus and Carex panza. And surprisingly, what we're finding with our head-to-head -head, uh, kind of comparison of the two is that at least here in full sun, yarrow is requiring more water throughout the last month or so when it's been really hot to stay vibrant and perky in full sun than the uh, Western meadow sedge, the Carex pragracillus has. Uh, but they're all both still pretty much hanging in there on the in the category of low water use plants, a little closer to medium than than you know, like the native sages, but uh, just a fraction of the water that a, a lawn would use. Like we are putting down on them average, we're watering them once a week and we're watering them uh, around a third uh, of what a lawn would use. Uh, it's been lower than I have been expecting. So we're pretty uh, pleased with that. The other one that we're testing, which sometimes you will see mixed in with native gardens, that's not a true native plant, it's a Southwestern native is buffalo grass. We're testing the UC Verde buffalo grass, which is doing very well and is, is also uh, doing very well in very low water. And so, so traditional lawn alternatives, if you want that green plain, you can. Uh, the Yarrow takes some limited foot traffic. The Carex does a little bit better. Uh, Yarrow, like you could lay out a picnic blanket and hang out in it. Uh, it's kind of scratchy. I wouldn't find that the most comfortable. Uh, the Carex, like the sunken Western Meadow Sedge Meadow that I have in my backyard, uh, we put chairs out in it. We kind of sit down in it and, and it does just fine with flight foot traffic. The buffalo grass can take uh, quite a bit. Uh, not like daily soccer practice, but you know, the occasional picnic or, or play from kids, not a problem at all. Uh, and so in the background, you can see, so working with this landscape is probably 75% native plants, uh, a hedge of Allen Chickering sage, so lawn and hedge. And here, Canyon Gray sagebrush, Pigeon Point coyote brush. Uh, this is uh, one of the native asters, a syngia, probably a smart aster. And a lot of clipping compared to a naturalistic native landscape to keep it this way. I would imagine this is definitely, this is one that's maintained. Uh, I know by Form LA, which is a landscape company active in the Los Angeles area. And I would imagine that they're here multiple times a month to do all that clipping. So it is higher maintenance. You don't get all of the habitat benefits that you would get if you had a little bit more naturalistic of a landscape, but compared to a traditional conventional landscape, certainly way more, certainly way less water. And so it can be obtained if you want that more quote, traditional garden look. Uh, container plantings, you absolutely can do native plants in containers if you don't have soil that you can grow in, or if you're in a rental, you totally can be successful in containers. Uh, quick tip is make sure you have good drainage holes in the bottom and work with cactus mix as a default. And then uh, there, there's some great uh, lists of plants for uh, containers. Theodore Payne Foundation, I believe has one on their website, but a lot of stuff, at least for a few years, will work quite well in containers. Just try to make sure that your container is appropriately sized and that your plants are mostly not trees, but you know, smaller shrubs can get by in a large container for a number of years usually. And then uh, perennials tend to do pretty well in containers as well. A lot of the ground covers actually make pretty good container plants as well, like this ground cover manzanita. So it's turned into like a semi bonsai. Patio spaces, you wanna be able to be out and enjoy your native plants. And to me, the most lovely patio spaces in native gardens tend to be kind of rustic and informal. And that accomplishes a couple of things. So this pea gravel patio space, which looks amazing, I think, uh, allows the mulch layer, the gravel mulch layer to go right into a little bit of light gravel mulch underneath the shrubs. So it creates a very naturalistic feel. When it rains, it's not like it's raining on a hard paved area. So the rain can soak right in. Uh, not causing any flooding problems, also just helping moisten the soil right where it falls. And the price is right. This is a fraction of the cost that it would take to install a 
wood deck or a uh, flagstone or a tile you know, a patio area. So that's an, another nice aspect of it. And environmentally, you know, the gravel normally comes pretty locally. Uh, a lot of the decomposed granite comes pretty locally. So there, there's a lot less environmental impact with working with these softer hardscape materials as well. Uh, decomposed granite is the other form of kind of naturalistic patio that often people employ. Uh, Decomposed granite is basically that stuff. You often find it in like uh, pathways and parks. Now it's not gravel. It's not quite soil. It's hard underneath the foot. You get a little bit of a crunch when you walk. And it is also generally pretty permeable. You don't want to use it on a slope because it will erode and run off. Even if you use the stuff with the binder included, uh, that binder kind of becomes reactivated. And when it's wet, it will still act like it's muddy. Uh, some people really like the look and the feel uh, versus gravel. When it is wet, you do need to let, let it dry some before you walk in it because it will turn muddy where gravel you can just walk on right away. But it does have a lovely effect. And if you are going to use it in a patio or walkway space, usually it's ordered with binder included. And then there's a process where you kind of wet it down and compact it. Is a lot of work, uh, but you can get a very great result in the long run and still less work and less cost than putting in like a traditional paved patio space. So that's decomposed granite. Here is thinking about, so patio spaces, thinking also about pathways. How do you walk through your garden, enjoy it and connect from your house to your patio spaces? Uh, so I really like this decomposed granite pathway with natural river rock edging. So an example using boulders or working with pavers, whether they're poured in place or things that you purchased. And then gravel in between, that's a way of having a harder paving, but still the water is going to be able to soak in right where it falls. Or gravel pathways, a lot of natural stone edging. Recycling your broken concrete. This is the price is right. Uh, low environmental impact, keep stuff out of the landfill. You do need a good back to do this. You, you can do it yourself if you're motivated, but each piece needs to be kind of individually leveled because concrete is often depends on the, the way it was poured and how uh, much the subsurface was prepared. But a lot of the times when it comes up, it, uh, it's kind of wavy on the bottom. So you need to kind of level each piece and they're heavy because normally they're four inches thick, but definitely a great thing to consider if you are up for the work or if your landscaper is going to be doing it. And it can be kind of any style. So I really like this example where it's a very kind of modern angular pavers with decomposed granite in between that just sweeps right into the landscape. And then it's kind of that almost cues to care balance again, where the formality of this very modern pathway then makes the wildness of the landscape area really work. Or a kind of more semi-naturalistic approach, almost with elements of a Japanese garden. You have flagstone with the decomposed granite in between, and then leading into a decomposed granite path. Or just working with pavers. So there's nothing functionally that you would achieve in this space above just having the wood chip mulch, but it draws the eye down. And for some people, this is going to have a little bit less rustic of a look, which maybe the homeowner likes for the kind of very modern style of the house. Or also, this is generally what I end up doing in, in the landscapes uh, that I build at home is the, the pathway is the spot of mulch in between the plants where you have left there to be no plants. Uh, the price is right to put this in. The mulch does need to be uh, renewed every few years. Uh, oftentimes local areas have free mulch giveaway programs. So you might be able to get that for free. And then sometimes uh, not having any edging, but also uh, just using branches, rock, uh, broken concrete, whatever you might have that you like the look of to kind of define the space if you want it to be a little bit more defined and mixing in. So in my backyard, it's the combination of all three, but mixing in the branches that provides other little habitats for uh, little critters, uh, beetles and things like that, shredders and decomposers, which in turn are bird and lizard food. So it helps keep all of that going. And then we're gonna talk about spaces for water. Again, there's a whole other workshop we have for this. However, just briefly looking at it, 
how, how these water spaces can interact with our native landscapes. So if you are setting up something like a dry stream bed in your native garden or an infiltration basin, you don't need to have it have rocks. It could just be a depression in the landscape that doesn't have rocks. Uh, sometimes some amount of mulch. So sometimes people use a combination of rocks, gravel, and wood chip mulch. If it's not going to be getting a ton of water into it, that's a way to go. If it's going to be getting a lot of water, the wood chip mulch does tend to float to the top. Can have plants in it uh, on the resource that we have created about plant choices that I'll share with you later in the Valley Garden Planner. Uh, I'll show you a list that we have of plants that work well even down in here that'll seasonally flood, but don't need a lot of water when it's dry. But oftentimes people work with rocks, both for the look and for the function of it. Top advice for that, work with a variety of sizes of rocks and just work with whatever rock is na native, local to your area for a couple reasons. First one, it's what you're going to be able to find multiple different sizes of to combine to get that naturalistic look. Second one is, at least down here, the cost of our local river rock is about a third of what it would take to try to do the same project with a kind of, quote, ornamental stone or an imported stone. Uh, also much more environmentally friendly. Uh, the local stuff is harvested locally. So a few different examples. If you don't have room for the depth of a dry stream bed, you can go with something that's more of what's called a French drain, which is a trench that then gets filled with a wide diameter gravel and the pore spaces in between the pieces of gravel, all those little air spaces become what can temporarily hold and allow that water to either sink in in place or move. Lots more about all of that in our Rainwater Harvesting for Home Landscapes workshop, which you can check out on our YouTube channel. And then even starting that rainwater kind of thought process with thinking about your spaces and can they be permeable instead of needing to wash the water off somewhere. And get as creative as you want, like in this landscape from the Theodore Payne Foundation Native Garden Tour, the Gotland Native Garden, where there is an extensive cat run through the yard. So to kind of wrap up this section, and then we'll take our break, this all sets us up to understand that planting design is just one part of design. And then now we, when we take this kind of design lens back to our native gardens, and we start thinking about the plant component, we want to remember a couple of things. First one is always put the right plant in the right place. And we're gonna talk about that a bit on the next slide. For putting plants together, most important things are to learn and respect what the plant needs are. We're gonna look at resources soon about that, how to learn that for the plants you're considering. Group plants with similar needs for water. That's the hydrozone concept. For sunlight, for soil drainage, we'll talk about that in a bit, et cetera. Look at that mature size of each plant. Remember that that plant is gonna get that big. Give it that space in the landscape. And if it looks like there's just too much space in between your plants as they're needing to grow in, sprinkle a little bit of wildflower seeds in between and call it a day. Sometimes people think, well, I'll overplant at the beginning and then I'll thin out over time. What happens is that everything is looking great right when the plants start to crowd each other and people never do that. And then before they know it, plants are overgrown, they're misshapen. Uh, there's a lot of kind of catch up work to do and it's never as good. So respect the space your plants need, but don't isolate them. You know, Don't have a couple of plants in a sea of mulch unless that's your specific goal. And then remember layering as well. So if you're planting your big tree, it's gonna take time to grow in. Think about trees, shrubs underneath the tree canopy, smaller plants uh, just don't have too much of a jumble. So that's the whole design process, thinking that through. And then over time, you're going to observe from what works and what doesn't. And inevitably, certain things won't work, even in professionally designed landscapes by the best designers that I've ever seen. A couple of years in, there's always something that, that wants to be tweaked and uh, improved. So learn from that and enjoy that as part of the process. So this might be the most important slide in this presentation. When I talk with people who are new to gardening or feel like they don't necessarily have a successful history with gardening, but they want to give it a shot, I always ask people who say that, you know, I have a brown thumb. When you buy a plant or you're thinking about buying a plant, do you research 
what the plant needs in terms of the sun and shade, soil drainage, water, and almost always the answer is no or not really. A lot of people just buy plants, put them in the ground and hope for the best. They just do something. And really most of the people who I know who I consider to be good gardeners, uh, it all starts with that little bit of research. And there's, I mean, it's so much easier to do now than it was even 10, 15 years ago. Uh, there's so much information online that before you go out and spend 12 bucks on a plant or more, if it's a five gallon plant, you really just take a couple of minutes and make sure that it's going to work well for your space or have that be part of the research of your design process. So those major factors, we talk some about sun and shade, soil drainage, basically. So some people get really into soil type. And if you know, if you have sandy well draining soil, loam or clay, that's great. But what I have found as I've tried to simplify explaining this to people over time is that it, it, for the most part, it comes down to just this simple concept. Does your soil drain well or does it not drain well? If you have heavy clay soil or even sandy soil that's been compacted because the truck parked there for the last 15 years, you might have slowly draining soil. And that's fine if you do. You just want to know it and adapt to it. So what you want to do to figure out your soil drainage is a quick drainage test. And we don't have too much time to get into that now, but I will say if you uh, check out the video about site assessment on the website that I'm about to show you, the Inland Valley Garden Planner, uh, that video is gonna be getting posted if in the next uh, two weeks. That's all about site assessment. I will walk you through every step of the process, but essentially dig a hole about a foot by a foot, fill it with water a couple of times and let it drain out just to make sure that all the, the soil around it is very wet and saturated kind of, and then fill it a third time and come back every hour and measure how many new inches of water have drained out of the hole. Do that over a number of hours until that hole is done. Take those numbers and find the average. You can just eyeball it or actually, you know, add them up and divide by the number of different measurements. Find that average number of inches that it drains per hour. That's basically what you're trying to find is how many inches per hour on average after all the soil around it is wet, will that hold drain water out? If your drainage is two inches per hour or more, you have well-drained soil. You can plant plants that want well-drained soil. Uh, and that's a lot of our native plants. If you have between one and two inches per hour of soil drainage, that's kind of medium. I've had gardens where I plant stuff that, that uh, wants well-draining soil and it does just fine. I've also had gardens where I plant stuff that wants well-drained soil in when tests look like that. And it'll be fine until we get a rainy season where there's storm after storm after storm. And then sometimes I've lost some plants. So in those medium, you can either plant what you plant and hope for the best, or maybe add a, some mounds if you have some extra soil and plant your plants that want well-drained soil, you know, a little bit higher up. If you have less than one inch per hour of soil drainage, you have slowly draining soil. Not necessarily a terrible problem. A couple of options. The main thing to do if you have slowly draining soil, especially if it's not because it's compact, but just because it's clay, is plant plants that are adapted to clay soil. There's lots of clay soil areas in California and lots of plants that are perfectly well adapted to it. Some of them are flexible, you know, can, can have well-drained or poorly drained soil. Uh, and th there's lists available and I will show you one. So in, in some ways, if you find out that you have heavy clay soil that drains slowly, uh, it's just fine. And in some ways it makes choosing your plants a little bit easier because there's just less plants to choose from, but still plenty of great plants to choose from for a great garden. Don't even bother thinking about adding sand to your heavy clay soil to change the soil type. It's not going to work. It's more a recipe for mixing up something that's more like concrete. What you can do is uh, adding a little bit of compost before planting can sometimes help stimulate uh, some soil structure formation that can lead to better draining soil. And then working with wood chip mulch over time, not burying your plants in wood chip mulch, but just a thin layer. Uh, two inches ish over time, not right up against the bottom of your plants, but kind of in between, at least until your plants start self mulching uh, can help as well. That adding the organic matter can help a little bit. Uh, irrigation frequency, and we'll look at that as we look at our online resources, but that hydrozoning concept. 
I uh, might think about growth habit shape. Uh, are your, especially your shrubs and trees, are they going to have low wide branches? Are they going to be kind of up and out? Just anticipating that some, so knowing how close to put plants next to it. And then growth rate. And that's something that if you have a lot of experience with plants, uh, you can take that into account. It's hard to find that information, honestly, and really know how to apply it if you're just getting going. So that's kind of an optional one. But remember, one thing to remember is that shade takes time. And oftentimes your trees, sometimes they'll bolt off right away, but oftentimes your trees will start slow and steady and then gain speed. And so give your, especially your trees or your large shrubs over time, make sure you give them some space. Or if you read that something is slow growing, like manzanitas are sometimes slow growing to get going, uh, give them some space, make sure you don't crowd them too much. Because for example, like bunch grasses grow quickly. Uh, you don't want to put your little one gallon tree or your manzanita all surrounded too close by like deer grass. And it's going to kind of shade it out and dominate it too quickly. So give your slow growing plants a little bit of extra space would be the main takeaway if you're just kind of getting into this. And with that, we're going to talk about choosing plants and a couple of main recommended sources. We are going to look at the Inland Valley Garden Planner and we are going to look at Calscape. Get some, we're going live onto these websites. And so the first one that we're going to look at is called the Inland Valley Garden Planner at inlandvalleygardenplanner.org. This is the website that we have developed at the Waterwise Community Center for our local area, which is the western edge of San Bernardino County in our service area. Uh, but in terms of inland valley conditions, this really is directly applicable in terms of the water information, all the nitty gritty details, directly applicable. Uh, consider it kind of like Riverside through the Inland Empire, San Gabriel Valley and San Fernando Valley. Everything is so similar in terms of climate, soils, uh, and weather and water needs that it's really directly applicable. Throughout most of the rest of Southern California, uh, other than the true desert and the mountains, most of these plants work great. Uh, on the coast, you can definitely water more on the low end. In like LA proper, you can water more on the low end. And then a few of these plants that we say need you know, part shade inland can take a little bit more sun or some plants that we say need full shade inland maybe can take a little bit more part shade if you're in a gentler climate, uh, but there's a lot of good resources uh, where, wherever you are. If you're in the true desert or in the mountains, some of these plants will work. And for those plants that will work, the information is gonna be pre pretty valid, uh, but you're gonna wanna supplement with local knowledge to find out if you have just too much heat or just too much cold in your local area. I'm excited to show this to you today. Uh, if any of you have used this website before, you'll notice that it looks a little bit different. We had been working behind the scenes on a major renovation expansion of this website, which literally uh, went online last night. So you are the first people to see this new version of the website. And so there's a couple of different things you can do. The center of it is a huge searchable plant database, uh, but we have other aspects as well. So there's some introduction kind of stuff. Uh, we have useful lists. This is a combination of native and non-native plants. There's detailed profiles of 350 plants adapted here. Uh, 120 something are native. Native is always my go-to, but we also want people to be successful with whatever plants they choose uh, within our, our area. And a lot of them are non-native, but allies that you often see showing up in mostly native gardens. Uh, those 120 something native plants are basically our top choices in terms of for the average gardener. What are plants, native plants that are generally pretty easy to grow? Uh, they're not super fussy with care or water because some great native plants can be pretty fussy. So they're the ones that are gonna be generally pretty easy to grow. And they're going to be the ones that are generally on the easier side to find uh, pretty reliably in stock at the beginning of the planting season at the nurseries that specialize in native plants, or they'll probably you know, get them in sometime soon if they don't have them at the time. There's a lot of other amazing native plants that are maybe they're a little fussier or harder to find. We just prioritize what are our top ones. Uh, and we'll talk about Calscape in a moment, which has the deep detailed information on the uh, most of those other plants that, that we do not cover. And uh, so we have some lists, we have our plant finder, and then we also have a garden design. So I will quickly walk you through that. 
the heart of this is the plant finder. So this is our searchable database where you can say, I'm looking for a shrub that's California native. Uh, it's gonna be in a low water hydro zone and my area is full sun and I want it to be good for butterflies. So then from all of the different plants that you could potentially plant in Southern California with all of those, especially with the butterflies one at the end, that gets you down to our top 17 recommendations. And you can take a look at the basic factors, height, width, exposure, gonna be in the main ones. And then on all of these, you'll see the water needs. I'll explain that in a moment. Know that there is the ability to group them. So if you have like low two and low one, low one for normal landscape performance is like our lowest and low two, is quite low, but it can take and will respond with a little more flowering later into the season with uh, some additional water. But you can water these together. They're both kind of in that low category. And even some on the medium, if you look at the nitty gritty details, you can group them together if you want to. There's some flexibility there. And so each of these has its own profile where you can see pictures. We normally try to provide ones where you can see it in the landscape when it's younger, when it's older, close-ups on the flower, a detailed description, and then the additional properties uh, in more detail as well, including flower season. So if you're trying to make sure that you have blooms year round, you have that. Uh, detailed information on the water needs for our inland areas. Uh, information on how, how often and how much water to apply. We do it in inches because then that scales to any irrigation system and any size, but there's links that go into how to figure out how long to then run your irrigation system to provide that many inches. If you are on a coastal area, if you water at the very low end of this, you're probably going to be good. And then something that we put a lot of work into because it's hard to find online is for each of these plants, we also have uh, maintenance. So there's very little maintenance required for this plant. Some of these it's longer. Some of them are me ranting about what not to do that I see people do in landscapes that they don't need to do. So each of these has maintenance. So you know what to do over time. So that's the plant finder. For those of you who are maybe feeling a little bit overwhelmed and want to know kind of uh, just what are some coordinated palettes of plants and ideas to get started with that you maybe can emulate, this is something brand new as of last night. We have a garden design section where we have these eight themes and a lot of them are either exclusively or focused on native plants. So we have an all native butterfly and songbird garden, California native color garden focused on color throughout the year, colorful desert garden, which has a lot of desert natives, uh, but some non-natives, uh, mostly native meadow garden, Mediterranean obviously is different, a native color garden, a native pollinator garden and native woodland garden. And so if you go to each of these, we have created basically what we call design templates that you could emulate. And so for these, we keep it a pretty tight planting list. And so if you're interested in native plants, you might use this as a starting point and then mix in compatible plants as you want to. But if you're someone who wants a butterfly and songbird garden, but you want to keep it simple with those top reliable native choices, then you might stick just to it. And so we provide example plants for three different sizes of landscapes, extra large, large, medium, and small landscapes. And then on each of these, you can see kind of a rendering of what that might look like. So the butterfly and songbird one has a high plant density. All of these you can do with a lower plant density if you want. Identification, we're working on rolling this out, but each of these have a version where you can also hover. And then if you click that, it'll just launch in a new tab plant profile. And then if you like the look of any of these, uh, the extra large ones have a patio space, which you can use in any size garden, but you can kind of see what it would look like with the plant combinations up close. And then for each of these, if you like that look, we also provide a scale. You can actually print it out if you want an 11 by 17 print and measure where one eighth of an inch equals one foot in the real world. And you can really understand the spacing for these plants. And so there is a little bit more space in between them than you can kind of see in the rendering. And so if you want, for example, like just what's happening around this patio, you can print it out, kind of measure that out and emulate it, but adapt it to your space. And that's the same for uh, all of the other sizes as well. Some of them, we have other kind of design concepts. Uh, like here, there's the 
dense yarrow area along the edge and the large one. But if you have a medium sized yard and you want to do that still, you can kind of mix and, mix and match the concepts. And then we're still building this out, but we're, we're building out kind of a lookbook for similar gardens. Uh, oftentimes gardens have a wider range of plant diversity. So we're trying to find uh, examples in our photo archives that really reflect the feel of these particular ones. Full plant list that goes plant by plant and you can select the plants again and launch those individual plant profiles. You see these hearts here. If you want to, you can actually create your own profile on a login and then create your own plant lists and save plants to make your own custom, you know, I list for your front yard, list for your backyard, list for your grandma's house. And then some additional information that you can launch, including again, irrigation schedules for this. And then for those of you who want to, we'll see, it might take time to load. You can actually download, if you're gonna to wanna to kind of print out a reference, a PDF packet where you can print it out. It's formatted for 11 by 17. Uh, you can print it smaller if you want, but if you wanna use the scale drawings and it kind of gives you the complete image set, including at the end, we'll give it a minute to load. Should have loaded this ahead of time. Oh, there we go, including a whole set of details and write-up about landscape features like dry stream beds and French drains that you might want to add in. There's also a lot of other stuff kind of buried in here, so I encourage you to check it out. And we have a number of things that we're gonna be loading now that this is up over the next few weeks, including a series of videos that will walk you through the whole design process in greater detail than we can do in any one specific workshop where we're, it's really gonna be step-by-step -step follow along with me where we walk you through how to do your scale drawing on graph paper of your property, how to go through the whole site analysis and design process. Uh, so that'll be something to check out. And then last thing I'll mention is there's also other things like helpful lists for our favorite plants for the Inland Empire, California native plants, and like I mentioned, uh, like plants for integrating either on top of directly next to or down in those dry stream beds. So you can get all of that information as well. Uh, and there will be more coming, but I think that's the time I want to spend on this. Uh, Another one, and so this to be to me is if you're local to us and looking for you know simple how to get started, I think this is a really great resource. Another great resource is Calscape, and especially for native enthusiasts who want to go uh, deeper, wider into native plants and pull from a much larger database. Uh, this is an incredible resource. I go back and forth using both Inland Valley Garden Planner and Calscape all the time. Uh, Calscape is a great reference, and you can do some really powerful searches, especially if you're interested in what would be local to your local area and really wanting to do a naturalistic garden of what would grow there. You can start by just typing in a zip code. So this is where we are at the Waterwise Community Center in Montclair. And here's native plants that were thought to historically be native to this area, 662 and the categories that they fall into. However, for home gardeners, something to be aware of is that some of these can be pretty fussy to grow. A lot of them are gonna be great, but some of these are gonna be pretty fussy to grow. And some of these are going to be hard to find. However, oh, I think this is new. I don't think they used to have this as a search result. That's awesome. What I was gonna say is for, for people who are just getting started, you want to find, and I, I only knew about this until now, uh, accessing the very easy to grow plants through the advanced search, but you might type in your zip code and then go to the very easy plants to grow. And so here's still 83 very easy plants to grow. They have different requirements. You want to read about them. And then you can get uh, information about all of them. Some of them aren't going to be good for everywhere. Like black cottonwood is an amazing plant, but it needs to grow basically near a stream or get a lot of water. And it's huge but a lot of them are great combination of annual wildflowers and longer perennial plants. And then there's great plant profiles with each of them. Uh, don't be intimidated like some of this, if it's not relevant to you, the native range, I find that fascinating. Sometimes uh, it's a little intimidating for first time gardeners, but take in what you want. Awesome information about wildlife that supports 
and other great information. So if you're not from Southern California, this is for the entire state. Uh, great, great resource. And something that I also like to do is I like to use the advanced search. Can do the zip code. You can do any of the factors, just like the Inland Valley Garden Planner, common uses. For, so bank stabilization is a really cool one if you have slopes, but also commonly available in nurseries. If you're just kind of getting started, uh, that might be something to add. And then you can do your search. And then you can go from there. So I'll normally recommend that people who are kind of uh, new to native plants do very easy to grow commonly available. And then it also gives you a nursery list. Some of those will be local, some of those will be not. Uh, in terms of where to get these plants, for those of you who are in Eastern Los Angeles County, Western San Bernardino County, I mentioned at the beginning, if you go to where we have uh, our presentations posted, cwcd.org slash presentations, which is up at the top of the chat, then uh, you can get our local landscape suppliers list and on there is a nursery list and we say which ones generally have a good selection of native plants. And then a new thing from Calscape, which is also pretty cool, they're very accessible, super simple thing to begin is they have a Calscape garden planner where you can say, where is your garden located? Uh, so let's say Montclair. What style best reflects your garden goals? Let's go with outdoor living. How sunny is your area? Full sun. What are your biggest priorities? Got to do water conservation. We are the water conservation district. And let's go with uh, deer resistant. That's a cool one uh, that if you're in an urban wildland interface area, you might be interested in and pollinator as well. And then they give you a nice condensed list of different things to think about. And then you can, again, get each of them. And then from there, kind of see, is it easy to grow? Am I likely to find it? All that sort of stuff. So there's other great resources online. Theodore Payne Foundation has a great website with lots of good information. Tree of Life Nursery in San Juan Capistrano has a great website with lots of good information as well as Las Palitas Nursery also. Uh, but in terms of easy searchable databases, these are a couple to get you going. And so with that, okay, so a couple of requests to put some links back into the chat. Oh, so someone typed in, as well, uh, Kit shared that Calscape is undergoing some significant changes that will make it a more powerful tool for gardeners uh, and also use the advanced search to find plants for the specific conditions and traits. Awesome, Kit. I look forward to seeing uh, what Calscape puts out. Uh, yeah, that's super cool to hear. And okay, so the links in the chat and then we'll get going into our example is, so uh, the link to download the local suppliers list, as well as the slides from this website is cbwcd.org slash presentations. I'll also share with you uh, our YouTube playlist, which will have this recording after some light editing next week and recordings of all our past workshops that I talked about. cbwcd.org slash YouTube and then Calscape calscape.org, uh, Inland Valley Garden Planner, this is Inland Valley Garden Planner, org. And then, uh, and then for the Calscape Garden Planner, I'm not sure the actual web address, but I always just type into the search engine Calscape Garden Planner and it comes right up. So those are our kind of top resources. And then also, uh, wherever you are in California, looking up your local chapter of the California Native, California Native Plant Society and getting involved there uh, is a great way to go, especially attending their meetings. I think they're mostly in Zoom right now. And then when things go back in person, back in person, oftentimes they do local garden tours and there's people 
who have been gardening enthusiastically with native plants in your area for decades usually. So, so much good local knowledge and questions you can ask if you're thinking, you know, is this plant gonna do well for me or what's your experience with that? Highly recommend that. Uh, okay, so a couple of other important aspects with choosing your plants. Tune into our seasons in California and understand that as part of your design. So if you're new to native plants, there is a beauty in gold and brown. So for example, I happen to be doing some pruning here, but I'm not pruning here on this California buckwheat to try to deadhead all of these flowers that have turned this rusty color. That's part of the look. That's part of the season. Some plants we will cut back, but the buckwheats are so floriferous and drive us crazy. And that's turning into uh, bird food. So that's just fine. Uh, certain plants are adapted to life in California and do that by going a little bit dormant in the summer. Sometimes that's a color change. Sometimes that's shriveling up just a little bit. So a couple of thoughts on that. One, that's the reason why a lot of our plants after they're established would live through the summer in Southern California with no water at all but they might not look good in our gardens. And if we're in an area where there's any uh, wildfire danger, uh, we wanna keep them a little bit hydrated as well. So that's normally the purpose for a once every three weeks to once every month irrigation is we just keep them, we don't provide a ton of water to really force them to grow all summer. Uh, that will result in a lot of them dying early and they won't necessarily look any better. In fact, they might look worse, but that just keeps them from going a little bit less dormant, but accepting a little bit of that. Because in Southern California, basically, ecologically, the middle of summer for a lot of our plants is our winter. That's how they survive this dry, dry summer. But in their own way, those plants have a beauty when some of the, the yellows or browns show up. And then the first rains in fall, that's the equivalent of our beginning of spring. And you can really tune into that and learn to uh, love that and the change throughout the seasons. If on the other hand, that's not for you, you can also choose evergreen California native plants that just look kind of at their, their peak year round. And if you look in the Inland Valley Garden Planner, we mentioned some of those. Those are some of the woody evergreens like Toyon, like Coffee Berry. There's, there's still slight variations, but you can, you can kind of keep things uh, a certain way if you want to. You're just going to have less choices. But I don't, I don't think that that's the best way to go necessarily. Embracing the seasons is great. Native plants are mostly easy to grow. They just require a little bit of learning and a little bit of that different approach, a little bit more judicious with water and uh, and just learning the needs of the plants. And so the Inland Valley Garden Planner can help you do that. We also have uh, a native and water-wise plant maintenance uh, class recording on our YouTube channel and installation and establishment for California native and water-wise landscapes. And I will kind of mention the timing of this class is intentional to be in kind of the late-ish summer. This is, it's not a formal series, but, but we calculate when we teach our topics going forward from here all throughout the fall. So this is native planting design. As we get more into the fall, we're going to have installation and establishment for California native gardens. We also have a class lined up that's retrofitting turf irrigation systems. If you're taking out a lawn or have an old sprinkler system for native and water wise gardens, talk about your uh, options for there. So look at our upcoming uh, run of courses. And it's kind of, if you have a large landscape project being planned, we're pacing it so that you can work with it through us and be set up to do your planting at the right time of year. If you currently have a lawn in an area that you're thinking about putting in a native garden though, I would recommend that you immediately check out our removing your turf the right way online workshop because summer like right now is the best time to kill turf and then you can be prepared. Uh, and if you're thinking about catching in on a, a turf replacement rebate program, you need to wait to kill your turf. And the best place to start is then going to be our landscape transformation basics class, which we teach one Thursday evening a month. And my coworker, Brandon, is going to be teaching that this coming Thursday, six to eight on Zoom. So you can get all of that on our Eventbrite page where you signed up for this class. And so I think what I'm going to do, because there's still so much more to cover, is 
I'm going to go through this question period, make sure we have time for a design process, and then I will have plenty of time to answer questions at noon. Uh, and I'm hey, happy to go as late as we need to. And so let's get going on to our example of the design process using my front yard where my partner Kira and I currently live in Pomona. You wanna start with some semblance of a base plan and you have a couple ways of doing that. So one of the videos that I have already recorded and maybe I will just post it onto our YouTube channel even before I put it onto the Inland Valley Garden Planner in case any of you want to use it. I think I'll, I'll do that uh, by midweek next week is about drawing your base plan to scale on graph paper because then you can note down your site observations and work on your design uh, doing that. It's not a complicated process. However, some people like me have an odd shaped wedged lot that are kind of awkward to lay out. So I go through all the tips and tricks, how to choose graph paper, what size your scale is, all sorts of that sort of stuff. And so that video will walk you through that process to get a base map and kind of walk you through until you get you know, something like that, a good clean base. However, although I highly recommend that, some of you are just not going to want to do that. And some of you, if you're a little bit more experienced with planting, maybe feel like good about, you know, wanting to think through the design process and then kind of wing it uh, on the actual plant layout. You don't need a whole scale plan. So it's whatever works for you. I'll tell you that in our, in our front yard, I did this. I also did it as part of the turf replacement rebate where you need to submit a plan. And your plan, if you're doing the turf replacement rebate can be a very rough sketch. Uh, I've seen the things that get approved. Some of them look like they're drawn by a seven-year-old. So it doesn't need to be like this, but I, I decided to you know, go ahead and do it. Uh, for our backyard though, we worked more intuitively and kind of laid out plants, stuck little flags in, uh, took turns standing in a place where we're gonna put a tree and looking at it. And you can do that as well. It just depends on the energy you want to bring to it and what's gonna work best for you. And so in this example, for, for the site analysis, I'll say that if you are going to draw it out on graph paper, you might as well do it at the beginning, because then you can work on layers of tracing paper or photocopies and have it off from there. But to do the first part of the design process, which is assessing your site, uh, you can just do a rough sketch. So on this one, I just did a super rough sketch. I pulled up my property and zoomed in on, on uh, Google Earth, which is a free download. You can also use uh, Google Maps if you want, but on Google Earth, you can download a little closer. I mean, you can zoom in a little closer. And then I just roughly drew the shapes. It's not to scale. But getting the basic shapes in, the basic relevant things, I realized as I had to do some plumbing work on the house before we moved in, that the water main became very relevant because it had been replaced at some point in time. It was only six inches deep. So I had to take that into account where most people might not need to take into account quite as much because it should be deeper. Always good to know where it runs though, normally from the meter to where you see the water going in directly into your house. Wouldn't put an oak tree on top of it, but normal plantings are not a problem. And then you always want to start with your goals, whatever they are. I teach another class that's called do-it-yourself landscape design, which focuses on much more kind of larger scale thinking about things. I we talk more about like backyard spaces. If you want to have like, you know, social spaces, a patio, a grill, all that sort of stuff. And we go into more about thinking about your goals, but it can be pretty simple. Start with your goals and your goals are whatever's going to be best for you for the project. But I like to write them down ahead of time. First thing. And so our goals for this front yard were to have it be beautiful, something to see both for us from inside the house, looking out, which is mostly how we're gonna interact with our landscape. We have a big backyard and a small front yard. So the backyard's the social space. Uh, and then also you know, walking to the car, coming back, or for the neighbors, walking in the neighborhood. We wanted to provide habitat, uh, all around habitat, but particularly in, in this front yard, uh, thinking about birds and pollinators, low water. We wanted to increase our sense of privacy. We live on a cul-de-sac with these medium-sized front yards, uh, 1,200 square foot planting area, but honestly feels smaller because of how the, the cul-de-sac is set up, uh, feels a little bit smaller. I was surprised when I actually measured it out. And because of the angles of the houses on the cul-de-sac and the fact that everyone just had flat front lawns and no big trees other than a few palm trees, uh, it really feels like houses are looking right into each other. So I wanted to have a little bit more of a sense of privacy without putting up like a formal fence or a complete hedge to turn our back to the neighborhood. Still wanted it to be inviting. Wanted to have the great smell of California native plants, 
as we're walking to the car, coming home, or also just on a hot summer day with the screen door open. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of street trees in our neighborhood, but because of that, this faces north and we have great views of the San Gabriel Mountains, snow caps of Mount Baldy in the winter, if we actually get snow. And so we wanted to provide a sense of shelter, but we wanted to strategically uh, make sure that we preserve that mountain view. So all things we can do, but again, if we just hit the nursery and start buying the plants that, that catch our eye, uh, probably wouldn't end up hitting all of those goals just randomly. So the first thing you're gonna wanna do in that is evaluate your site and think about the plants that you want to keep. Because even if it's not native or even if it's not low water, if you have a big, beautiful tree providing shade, might be worth continuing to water it as it needs as a medium water use plant. But then you can absolutely work with native plants that can tolerate medium water use. And there's lots of them. Like I mentioned, our fruit treat zone, which is actually high water use, and we have native meadow plants underneath. Your garden doesn't need to be all or nothing with California natives. Match and you can look up uh, especially on, on Cowscape might be your best bet, uh, native plants that can tolerate regular water. And then you're going to go into your site assessment. Important thing is observe. Observe for as long as it takes. If you've just gotten to your property, you might even wait a little while. I really encourage people to be there through at least one good rainstorm. Uh, sometimes the water is going to pool or the quality of water that pools at different places might be more than you're expecting. And being there through one good rainstorm and seeing what happens to that water can be really useful in figuring out what you need to do. Do you have flooding issues? Uh, do you need to dig a dry stream bed or, or a French drain and move that water somewhere? Uh, a lot easier to do that before you put your plants in. You're going to need to be removing plants and most plants uh, don't transplant that well after they've gotten established. So figure that out ahead of time. Sun and shade is important to note down, your soil and drainage. Views, both out of and into the property. So do you want more privacy? Do you want to preserve certain views? Those water flows, any microclimates, noise or other neighbor issues. Uh, do you need something like a recirculating water feature to have the bubbling of noise to dampen the, the noise from the neighborhood? And then existing plants. And also sometimes we work with people, seasonal weeds. Like if you have a really bad invasion of nutsedge in one corner of your yard, maybe you're going to wait an extra season to plant that corner. You'll plant everything else and just know you really need to work on the weed abatement for another season there. Or just leave it mulched with a thick layer of cardboard underneath the wood chips and try to smother it out. And then make sure you include all the important stakeholders in your planning. So actually we did think a lot about our our cats uh, in the planning of this, they spend more time in the house than we do. And so setting up, you know, where the bird bath is to make sure that they can see the best action uh, is something that we took into account. But if you have kids, uh, any of that sort of stuff, uh, you know, really asking people for other thoughts, uh, you might get some terrible ideas that, that you then very gracefully uh, ignore, but you might get some great ideas that you weren't thinking about. Uh, Okay, and then also, so in also the site assessment, uh, thank you for, for uh, typing into the chat kit. So where we are, uh, we're a pretty urbanized area. Uh, some people like in Chino Hills or Rancho Cucamonga are in those are urban wildland interface areas. But uh, the one thing that we don't have time to get into, but again, there's been so many great resources put out online in the last few years, is if you are, are in a wildfire area, there are other things to take into consideration from plant density to zones of irrigation to a certain space from your house where you're not going to want any plants potentially to an irrigated zone. There are definitely native plants that can be in that highly irrigated zone to areas where you're gonna have lower plant density working with native plants that get only occasional irrigation. So that goes beyond the scope of what we can focus on in this workshop, but you can apply all of these concepts to that uh, other information you want to supplement. So thank you very much for mentioning that kit. Uh, okay, so site analysis. Again, doesn't need to be rocket science. So you know, don't let the word analysis uh, intimidate you. Here's what it looked like for the most important things for our front yard. 
just putting it down. So this is also going to be our tool that I'm going to be looking at as I'm developing my detailed design. So mountain view, just having it there. So as I'm thinking about the placement of trees, I'm remembering, make sure I place them to where I can still maintain and ideally frame some of that mountain view. This is the area that feels too open, main planting area. This house faces north. And so we do have that area generally north, a little bit off true north, uh, but generally north. So we have this area immediately next to the house where for a number of feet out throughout a lot of the year, the sun is a little bit in the south side of the sky and it casts a shadow in this area. But then right now in summer, full blasting sun throughout most of the day. And so that's an area where generally you're going to need to select from plants that are tolerant of either full sun or part shade or sun to shade. But normally what I find is plants that can take full sun or part shade, but they need to be able to take both are normally going to work pretty well in that Northern exposure. And, uh, so that's going to take special considerations, getting that down and my estimate of how far out that's going to be uh, on my site plan. This is a single story house, which has driveways on both sides. So if you are in a two or three story house and it's denser, wider out, you're going to have a deeper shadow area where you need to take that into account. And then we actually did have, uh, after we got through our first rains, after we moved in, realized that we have a actually a pretty significant flooding issue where we'd have like up to an inch of water when it rains, just settling it against the house uh, and the foundation, have to trudge through that because it's a gentle slope. And then we get the water from the driveway and it would come out this way along the walk and have nowhere else to go. We also don't have uh, roof gutters. The eaves are kind of curved. I guess it was considered ornamental at the time that this very generic 1950s house was built, uh, but it mean kind of major surgery to well attach uh, roof gutters. And so it just sheet flows off the roof and settles here. And so getting all that down to know that we're going to need to take into account quite a bit, turning that into a solution. So then reflecting on again, right plant, right place. We'll talk about that. And we did have good soil drainage, typical loamy valley soils. So then from doing that, you're going to go back into your plant resource or plant research with those best resources, checking in online. If there's local garden tours, go on those and visit local public gardens and nurseries with native plants. So here is a list if you're anywhere near where we are in Southern California. California Botanic Garden is great. Uh, some stuff is going to be ac applicable to home gardens. Some is going to be kind of interesting native plant collections. So it won't tell you exactly what to do, but definitely worth seeing. And a lot of the plants are labeled. Tree of Life Nursery in San Juan Capistrano has great nursery, but also uh, some really nice demonstration plantings. We have a lot of native plants at our WaterWise Community Center Garden in Montclair. We have done a lot of planting over the last couple of years, uh, increasing our emphasis on natives. And a lot of those plants have just got an excited uh, big shipment of plant labels in. So we'll be getting caught up with that. Uh, so, but a mixture of established and younger plants. And then Theodore Payne Foundation in Sun Valley also has uh, some great native plantings and is an incredible year round nursery, and, as well as some of the other botanical gardens locally do have native plantings. So, as you do your research, you're going to fall in love with a bunch of plants. This is a time to remind yourself of your goals. If you want to have a super diverse plant collection because you're a gardener and that's what you love to do every weekend, that's great. But for a lot of you, this can be your time to remind yourself to keep it simple. Don't put in too many plants and crowd them all together. And so from there, roughly starting to work out multiple versions. Normally I'm working on tracing paper. I just did this because it, it reads easily on the slide. Uh, multiple versions of basic design concepts. So not even worrying about plants yet, usually. Uh, so here, for example, we decided that our main view of the mountains that we wanted to leave would be kind of through this area over here. And then also we had right across the way, a uh, one of the large trees in the neighborhood is already kind of blocking our mountain view here. So here would be where we have our small tree. And then we're hoping to keep a gap in the mountains, but our, we eat dinner right here. And here's also our living room. And it looks mostly out at the driveway in the street of the cul-de-sac in our neighbor's driveway. And so we wanted a small evergreen tree here to provide a sense of shelter and something nicer to look out out this window. This was a really critical view for us, which is just not nice. And it's just starting to grow into be nicer now that the plants are growing in. Here, 
These windows looked out just at our neighbor's gravel strip and driveway. We didn't need to see this at all. Uh, so we were gonna put in an informal hedge of good habitat plants. And then we had decided that although we want the view to be lovely from every direction, really because we don't spend a lot of time in the front, the main build out of the, the view, the kind of most lovely view that we really want to consider would be from inside the house looking out from these rooms, which all look prominently out into the front yard. And so we set up our main layering in terms of getting a sense of depth from the house looking out, also the stoop and the screen door when it's open. And so we got a concept of having some low plants here, uh, framing up against the house where it's just stucco, framing the windows with some shrubs and maybe just a branch or two would kind of break that view, but mostly looking out into low perennial plant plants and informal meadow around a bird bath that could be seen by us and our cats from both these rooms where they spend a lot of time. And then there'd be room for a kind of a shrub layer in between, so smaller plants, medium-sized plants, and then our trees and our taller hedge layer in the back. And that would create an increased sense of depth in what feels like when it's very open, a pretty, uh, not a tiny space, not a postage stamp, but not a large space at all. And because we're building that out in a way where it's gonna be permeable to the view, but in a slight way turns its back on the street, we wanted to make sure that we include pops of perennial color in some of these corners. So, you know, as someone's walking by uh, or how the neighbors have a view, it's not really turning its back. And so we had that before we were really even starting to think about plants. And, and to be honest, you know, I already know and love certain plants. Like I, I kind of knew that I wanted this to be a toy on, but not jumping to conclusions too quickly. From there, not worrying about individual plants, we started thinking about what plants would fit into each zone. And so, you know, kind of starting to figure out like for the trees, uh, maybe those species, but in general, like for those color pops, starting to make the list of the plants that we think are gonna be most appropriate. For the middle, having looked at it more, I realized that there's more room for a series of shrubs, kind of the roughly the plants that are gonna be appropriate. We decided it's gonna be some shrubs, some deer grass. Uh, decided that our, our kind of meadowy area, yarrow would be the main plant. And then here were the plants that can take uh, part shade or some areas full sun, except for the native strawberry, which we kept right up against the base of the house. Uh, but the plants that would work in the situation, not each plant, but our, our main species for our loose uh, hedge that we're gonna have here. And then from there, once we have that, you can then refine it to those individual plants. And so most people would do this scale on graph paper. And in the next series of videos that we're gonna get up online, I will show what that looks like and kind of redraw that one step at a time to rebuild the process. In this one, I happen to be working on computer uh, because I do a lot of landscape drafting on computer, but either way, kind of a series of circles, roughly the size. And that's the, the use of doing it to scale is you can really get your plant counts and make sure everything is gonna fit. And, and where each one, whether you do a symbol or if it's a high plant diversity, I tend to do initials, and then you can have your little key and feel it out. One of the nice things about doing this on graph paper is you can have multiple versions and then you don't need to like restart. You can kind of trace uh, pretty quickly uh, instead of having to like redraw on a new base plan each time. And so in the last few minutes, I'll kind of show you how this all grew in as we went from concept to uh, building it, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers. So here is it when we started, uh, semi-abandoned lawn. This is actually when we moved in. Here is it when we applied for our turf replacement rebate. So pretty brown, we hadn't been watering at all, uh, but the thatch is still there. Uh, we weren't interested in keeping any of the little shrubs that were there. So everything got pulled out. And here was planting day. Most of the lawn was actually dead. The green you see here was just some little uh, poa, just little uh, weedy, but annual grass and working with planting. So this, because we had our meadow working with a lot of small four inch plants, this is actually a pretty high planting density and we had our hedge. And as you're laying it out, designing with your body, walking through, does it feel like everything is spacious enough? Uh, Remeasuring, I actually, 
am not above getting out with the measuring tape and, and trying to be super accurate and then loosening it up and moving things around a little bit. And to the best of your ability, your mind's eye, picture how it's going to grow in. If you have something down on a written plan, feel free to like, that's just a tool. You don't need to stick to it. So you, that might be getting you as far as getting you there. And then once you start laying things out, you're making some changes, moving things around. I always do that. Uh, and, and oftentimes you'll lay things out and then you'll actually be standing there picturing it all. And you'll realize another view lines up a little differently and maybe two plants are going to swap their locations. That's totally good. So my partner, Kira getting started. Here we had to deal with this flooding situation. We dug a trench for a gravel filled French drain that was gonna bring water, let some soak in in place, but in a large storm event, bring things around the side and out into our dry stream bed. So the French drain continued all around the side of the house. Here's March, plants went in the ground. Uh, to, to me really in Southern California, the sweet spot if you can for planting a native garden is think kind of Thanksgiving to uh, New Year's-ish. Uh, late fall, early winter, especially if you get it in late fall, uh, there's still enough heat to get some plants, stimulate some growth. But then over the winter, they're really going to be rooting in, which will have a much more robust root system to support abundant spring growth. Uh, but really try to get it in by March. Uh, here, uh, we had just moved in. We weren't ready to plant in the winter, uh, but we weren't going to leave the yard looking like that. And we weren't going to water a lawn for another season. So we got things in before the end of March. And that worked out well, but normally that's okay. You just need to pay a little bit more attention to careful uh, watering the first season. And then our weed abatement approach was to work with cardboard mulching or sheet mulching. This is mulch for the front yard and the backyard. And our backyard is really large. So you don't need that mulch, much mulch just for the front. So accumulating old cardboard boxes, good overlap. We knew that we we're going to have some Bermuda grass coming back and all of our neighbors have Bermuda grass lawns. So as much overlap as possible, six to nine inches to do the best you can. And then you're just going to pull up whatever comes out through there. Again, if you're going to be doing uh, your own turf removal or smothering, check out our killing your turf the right way workshop. And, you know, at the beginning, most people think, oh my God, these plants, I planted them too small. I should have got larger plants. Uh, I need to put in way more but they're gonna get growing. So this is at about two months. This is our red bud. I like to plant everything from one gallon, even the trees, if I can find them. Uh, a little bit of color, two and a half months. You can see the, we're starting to work some larger rock in, be more naturalistic, but the functional elements of the French drain are in. A little bit of growth, the yarrow meadow, yarrow grows pretty quickly growing in. And then one day I had the screen door, or the door open, just the screen in August. And I realized you don't really see the design yet because things are small, but at five months, it's a garden. You don't see much of that mulch. We have that higher plant density, especially where the plants are closer together. On the outside, you do see some of it because the plants are farther spaced apart, red buds starting to grow in, pops of color, California fuchsia. If you build it, they will come. So I don't know where leaf cutter bees, native leaf cutter bees were hanging out in my neighborhood in Pomona, but then we see the evidence that they're using Western red bud, which they love to build their nests. So starting to see a little bit more of it coming together. In August, we had a resident hummingbird move in and every morning I'd see her hanging out on this one dried stem of California fescue and then chase other hummingbirds or catch gnats and come back. And this is trash day, but still starting to have lovely moments, even though things are still growing in. You always lose a couple of plants, uh, ask yourself why. So red buckwheat does really well, but this was a little bit, maybe too much reflected heat. We planted three, one of them took and continues to live, uh, but ultimately other things grew in and we just put a tree stump there. We didn't feel like we needed another plant. So six months, again, a lot of growing to do, but starting to get these lovely moments. At 13 months, we had another uh, pile of mulch delivered for the backyard. So I climbed on top of it to get a little bit of an overhead perspective. So those pops of color have really grown in. The trees, the toyon and the Western redbud are still taking more time, but you know, it's a garden uh, when you're in. And again, starting to have these lovely moments where color and the texture are really there. Our hedge is still growing in some. Uh, and now a little bit later, uh, this hedge is all the way to the property line. and I trim it back some. So it really has grown in quite a bit. 
Here's the view from the room that our cats spend most of our time in. So you're starting to see this little bit of privacy coming in. We're still gonna get more over time. And talking about the seasonality. So 13 months, here's early spring. And then the same as a different cascade of plants come in, in the middle of summer. And then just to end it on a very honest note, we talked about seasonality. You know, things don't always look like springtime all the time, but I still find this September 2020 after a record heat wave where it had gone high into the triple digits, I uh, still find this much more lovely and interesting than any conventional landscape, embracing that those seasonal browns, and then still have some plants like our very beautiful Lamus Canyon prints, as well as our Oregon grapes and coffee berries that are deep, deep green. And things like coffee berry, which just keep going year round, strong and sturdy, manzanita. And so I think, why don't we leave it at that? For those of you who are gonna to wanna to download the slides, there are some, there is a little bit of additional content that I will walk you through. Uh, I do have a few more pictures of like late summer, early fall, kind of the stars from my backyard that do extremely well in this sending that blooming season and can just really take the heat. We talk a little bit about selecting which mulch. If you really want to get into that, we have a whole class on compost and mulch for water wise gardens. There's also on the Inland Valley Garden Planner on those detail pages, a lot of information about mulch and selecting your mulch. Top tips about designing for habitat, but really if you're interested in that, we have the gardening for birds, butterflies, pollinators, and more class, which is taught through a native plant perspective, but we get really more into setting things up, the features, the top plants. And then finally, we never get to this when we teach the class, but on the PDFs as a reference, I have a list of, for the Inland Valley area, a suggested kind of top basic plant palette for beginners, for native plants. And all of these have profiles on the Inland Valley Garden Planner. I'm sure they all have profiles on Calscape as well. And just kind of some of my favorite choices. So with that, I am going to put up a final slide that has some resources. And before you leave, I am going to, so I think we're gonna lose the resources slide uh, again. Before we leave, I do want to ask you to, and I will start answering questions, please fill out this very quick four question closing poll. 